Welcome back to back the to podcast. We like to call it a freak flag. Feel good. Fake it till you make it. Ric Flair. Woo! Football 512 Friday edition of the broadcast. That's right. I can call it a football Friday because we do, hopefully, fingers crossed, have spring football coming up this weekend. Uh, if we don't still, we're going to talk about spring football even that much better. All right. We'll get into, of course, some spring football news, notes, and nuggets. We'll talk about that today, of course. Uh, we'll also go behind the burnt orange curtain next segment. There was a player availability, so we'll hear from one of those players coming up uh, behind the burnt orange curtain. Talk some Texas football. NBA playoffs. Right up this weekend, you got the rest of the play in games coming up tonight. We'll preview the play ins, but also give a little mini preview to the uh NBA playoffs. The first round, uh, we'll get into that coming up here in this segment. Uh, also, coming up later on, we got the draft later on uh, this month, actually. Next week, we have the NFL draft, so still a lot of buzz about that. We'll talk about uh, some of the um. The salacious stories uh, right now uh, that are maybe, maybe dropping some of the trap, some of your favorite Longhorns. Uh, we'll get into that coming up uh, next hour. We'll also get into Bucky Brooks's top five players at every position. There's some Longhorns getting some love there as well. Uh, we got some uh, discussion about the CBS top 100 players in college football. There's a ranking. Uh, we'll see how many Longhorns are getting uh, some recognition on that top 100 list of college football players for the 2024 season. Uh, we also have Rod's rant. Uh, that'll be spring football related. Going to tell you what you should be looking for uh, conceptually at the uh, at the spring game. You're not going to see a lot of wrinkles, not a lot of uh, new concepts from Sark. You're not going to reveal that, uh, but there are some go-tos. There are some staples to a Steve Sarkisian offense uh, that you're definitely going to see at the spring game. So we'll talk about those coming up. We go uh, into Rod's rant of the day. Uh, so we got a lot to get into and not a lot of time to do it. So let's not waste any time. Without further ado, let's introduce the real MVP, one of the hardest working members of the ARM family. Uh, he's got a hustler spirit, period. I don't know what he's paid, but he's underpaid. Uh, <laughs> ain't no four he gets hustler, and he's a hustle man of many talents. We call him the idea you know on the show. Uh, he's got a lot of names and he wears a lot of hats. He is my friend, co-host, and neighbor. It's Patrick Davis, y'all. What's going on, Patrick? Doing good, doing good. Uh, it is NBA playoffs time, so that mm-hmm. makes me happy because I can yeah, watch man. NBA all weekend and all the games matter because <laughs> it's the playoffs. So I'm a happy man about that. Hopefully the weather will hold off and we'll watch the spring game. Uh, tomorrow as well. But let me introduce my co-host. He's a proud alumni of DBU. He's got more papers than Dunder Mifflin and watches more film than Siskel and Ebert. He is the new Rod father of Austin Sports Radio, Mr. Rod Babers. All right. Thank you for the intro. I appreciate it. As always, it's a Friday show, uh, which means it's a 512 Friday. That's my man Patrick plays jams from local bands and artists that you can Catch live right here in the ATX. Uh, so we always have fun with that. Uh, we'll also have Patrick with the big fat poll today coming up at 6:45. You don't want to miss that. Uh, as a matter of fact, Patrick also will get us our horn headlines here momentarily so we can really kick things off and get it started. Uh, but like I said, we'll get into some NBA. He's excited about the NBA playoffs. We'll start up this weekend. So we'll preview the play-in, the last of the play-in games coming up tonight. Uh, and then we'll give a little preview of the NBA playoffs. Also, um, should have got into Texas reportedly going to be really a Aggressive in the transfer portal uh, at one specific position. And I think everybody knows what that position is, the interior defensive line. Um, and there are a few candidates out there uh, in the uh, transfer portal uh, that Texas could look to acquire. I mean, Bobby Burton over at On Texas Football thinks it could be multiple D-line, D line D tackles taken in the transfer portal in this window. They already got one in Tia Savea. They could have another. So we'll talk about that too uh, coming up later on this segment. If we don't have time in this segment and we're too heavy with NBA, we'll just push it to behind the burnt orange curtain and we'll discuss it there because i know it's top of mind for a lot of longhorn football fans all right let's not waste any time patrick's gonna get us updated gonna get us educated and informed with all the big headlines of the day oh do not forget of course the text line is there for you 512 you can hit that up anytime uh with questions comments uh we'll get it off your chest you can do that on the spe- on the text line and also that's where we discuss usually the the, the big fat poll of the day and other things but before we do that uh patrick don't hit us up with the Horn headlines to get us updated and educated on the big headlines of the day. All right, your Horn headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Texas baseball will look to get their season back on the right track in their weekend series with TCU starting tonight. The Longhorns are one and four in series openers in Big 12 play this season, not winning an opening game since Texas Tech March 8th. But Texas will pitching will hope to get a break against a team that has not scored more than four runs in a game since March. 
Texas softball will take their record of six straight wins against ranked teams to Kansas this weekend to take on the Jayhawks. Sophomore catcher Reese Atwood will look to make history as he, she is only six RBIs away from setting the single-season RBI record at Texas. In the NBA, the final play-in games will be settled tonight with the Bulls taking on the Heat and the Kings facing the Pelicans. Both Jimmy Butler and Zion Williamson will miss their respective games due to injuries suffered in the 7-8 matchups. Despite the injuries... Uh, the Heat are still favored to beat the Bulls. However, Sacramento gets the slight edge against New Orleans. In Major League Baseball, the Rangers withstood a tough first outing for rookie Jack Leiter, who gave up seven earned runs in three and two-thirds inning to win 9-7 to seven and win the series against the Tigers. In action starting today, the Astros will start a series versus the Nationals with Justin Verlander returning from injury, and the Rangers will begin their series with the Braves with pregame beginning at 545 right here on the Horn, and that is your Horn Headlines. All right, Patrick, thank you for the horn headlines. Yeah, injuries uh, playing a huge role early on uh, in the playoff picture, uh, at least in the play-in early on. And I saw this from a, a, a data scientist about the, um, the the total amount of games lost in the, in the NBA due to injury, rest, personal reasons, or suspensions, just total games lost. And – the healthiest team in the NBA, and this is actually not a surprise the way it works out in a lot of sports. You got good injury luck, it'll help you out. The Oklahoma City Thunder had the fewest amount of games lost. If you look at it to injury, rest, personal reasons, suspensions, or anything. And they've had a fantastic season. Um, but the uh, the team that's that's been hit hardest, at least in the regular season, uh, were the Memphis Grizzlies. They were hit the hardest. Um they they had they had a ton of guys end up missing time. They lost. I think it was total five. The number here is five hundred ninety four uh, total games lost. Yeah, basically. I mean John Moran, but, you know, combined. basically yeah. played only a few games this season because he had the suspension and the suspension. Then he got came back, got hurt. Marcus Smart, who they traded for from the Celtics, and was supposed to bring some toughness, replace the toughness Dylan Brooks had. Uh, he was hurt most of the season as well. So, yeah, they, they just had a ton of injuries all season long in Memphis. Uh, it was already going to be a, a tough hill to climb to keep that record up where it was last season. Uh, but, yeah, that it, it was definitely not the season they were expecting. Yeah, no, I just because I, I was thinking about all the injuries. So I went to go see, like, oh, man, I have these teams been dealing with a lot of injuries. Um, some of these playoff teams the entire season, uh, not most of them, a lot of them have had pretty good injury luck so far. Um, but, yeah, it's playing a huge role. Uh, let's start with the play in games and then we'll work we'll work our way to the playoffs. Um, and then I want to talk uh, Texas football uh, transfer portal specifically because uh, the reports are Texas is going to be really aggressive in the transfer portal coming up um, at the D tackle position. Uh, let's start those Chicago at Miami. Is there even a reason to discuss this with Jimmy Butler and now out with the MCL injury? Do the. Uh, did the Miami Heat have any chance? The Bulls have dealt with a lot of injuries too. Alex Caruso is dealing with; he's got a foot injury, so he's going to be out. He's their uh, best defender. Jimmy Butler is obviously Miami Heat's best player. Uh, it'll Kobe White has just been phenomenal, um, and he has doubled his points per game average this season. Had that forty-two point career high game versus Atlanta in the play-in. The, the most remarkable stat about that we didn't even talk about it yesterday. When we when we discussed his you know uh, his breakout performance, forty two points versus nine, nine rebounds, six assists, zero turnovers, didn't turn the ball yeah, over one crazy. time. That's amazing, right? Yeah. To be to have to handle the rock that much. Uh, but what are your thoughts? Because injuries actually they been hit both of these teams really hard. You talked about the Bulls dealing with a lot of injuries um, all season long. What are your thoughts about this matchup? No Jimmy Butler. I mean, I'm surprised. Miami is still the betting favorite. That's the surprising point. They're one and a half point that favorites in this game. Yeah. Uh, with Tyler Hero leading the way, with Tyler Hero, I he's he had a just god awful shooting game uh, against Philadelphia. Tyler Hero, I believe, went uh, nine for twenty seven in that game. Uh, so not a great, not a great shooting from Tyler Hero in that game. He's going to have to come through big for you. You really the diff, the big difference is Miami's going to play much much tougher defense on uh, Chicago. So Kobe White's probably not going to have another forty two point game, but he'll he'll still be able to provide for them. Uh, it's, you know, this is a matchup of two teams that are really kind of beat up. Uh, I, you know, you, you think the culture of Miami could still make this a game, uh, but Chicago and, and look in all reality, you hope Miami wins and that there's some way Jimmy Butler can find a way to get back at some point in the series against Boston because Chicago is, it's a four game sweep. There's not, it's no contest. Yeah. There's no reason to even play the series really other than to get Boston some work. 
Uh, they said they're not they're not going to be a matchup for Boston. Uh, Miami's not really going to be much one either. Uh, but at least they have a culture that's going to annoy Boston a little bit. Maybe sneak beat out a game. Up a little bit. Yeah, beat, beat them up, up a little, little bit. bit. Maybe get them in there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this feels like it's going to be Chicago. But I, I've you know you learn over the years to not count out Miami in the playoffs just because what they've been able to do over the years. So Spolster's a hell of a coach. Yeah, I, I, I'll say it's going to be Chicago just because they have more guys ready to go. And Miami is just really, really beat up right now. And Jimmy Butler going down kind of just, it feels like that may be a mountain too, too tall to climb. Yeah, my uh, when I did the research on total games lost, Miami sixth in the NBA in the regular season in total games lost, yeah. uh, Chicago ninth. ninth. <laughs> so it feels like Chicago two. should be more. I it guess it, feel like I, I feel like yeah. they're not counting Lonzo Ball on that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know because because that's that's I believe eighty two. If we're gonna say yeah. Lonzo, that's that's the entire season that Lonzo that's Ball true. is supposed to be on this. They got team. Chicago with two hundred forty nine total missed games. So yeah, you're right. That I mean that would if, if he's counted, that's that's damn near. <laughs> yeah, that's a big chunk of that. So yeah, uh, now you're right about. It. I, I I don't know the criteria. I got it from uh, you know, like I said NBA data scientists. So I I, I yeah. imagine they got their own criteria for it. But those are like you said. My point is. Beat up teams. They've been yes. beat up all season long, and they've been finding a way to make it work. And now in the playoffs, dealing with even more injuries. Um, jumping to the uh, the other side of things, uh, Sacramento at New Orleans. New Orleans, strangely enough, five and zero versus Sacramento in the regular season, and no Zion. Getting back to the injuries, uh, no Zion. He's going to be out. He's got the strained left hamstring that he's dealing with. That's why uh, he left the game with about three and a half minutes left against the Lakers. Um, I mean, and he was. Phenomenal. I mean, he really was. He was that was his great performance. He was he actually outscored the rest of the starters on his own team. Yes. Uh 40 to 34. <laughs> I mean, he was, like I said, he was a force of nature in that game. Uh CJ McCollum, Brandon Ingram were not. They were eight of twenty-seven combined. Now both of those guys got to step up their play with Zion being out. Uh, what are your thoughts about this matchup? Sacramento still got, I mean, Ke Ke uh, Keegan Murray had a fantastic game, 32 points, had eight three-pointers versus Golden State. Darren Fox, uh, we know Sabonis is a really good player. They still got their core, um, but without Zion, um, I mean, I don't know if New Orleans can keep up that, uh, that, that undefeated streak they have right now currently going on against Sacramento. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be, it's going to be, you know, especially if you can get Sabonis in foul trouble, then Pelicans have a real good shot because this is the Pelicans are all about depth. They have a really good bench. They've got a lot of guys on that team. They're they're one of the teams I said before. They're almost too deep. You feel like they should have tried to pare this down and, and trade some of that depth to get a little bit more front court help. Uh, but it ends up that they're they've got a lot of depth. Sacramento has none with Malik Monk and Kevin Herter out that they're really down to it. So they need all the guys to play. It, watching the two last games, it feels as if Sacramento, if they can come out with that energy that they came out with against Golden State, if they have that urgency that they played with against the Warriors, then Sacramento could run away with this just because they played a really you know tough, hard game against the Warriors where the Pelicans, without Zion, are not necessarily in that game. The bench really carried them through. Brandon Ingram's going to have to get some more you know urgency in his game. C.J. McCollum has to start hitting shots. He has not been great down the stretch. Uh, Brandon Ingram was not great in that game. Uh, so if those guys step up, it's easily the Pelicans game. They have a much more talented roster uh, overall. But I'm going to say Sacramento just looked in, in the last play-in game. Sacramento, the guys that are going to be on the court tonight, looked better yeah. than what the Pelicans look like if you take Zion out of the equation. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And uh, one of the defensive matchups to watch, it, who is Key and Ellis going to be on? Uh, I was looking at, in, I was l listening to NBA Today. Uh, they were talking about he would likely defend Brandon Ingram. He did a great job on Steph in that play in matchup. He had three steals, he had three blocks versus Golden State. I believe his plus minus was plus 27. I mean, he was their lockdown defender. Um, I wonder if he's going to be on Brandon Ingram's now that they don't have to worry about Zion. Um, if he'll be on Brandon Ingram and then you know, even force Brandon Ingram into an, you know, an, an ineffective, uh, inefficient game. Uh, and they would really, you know, have to find other ways to, to score and put points on the board. And Sacramento won't have a problem with that. I mean, Keegan Murray and De'Aaron Fox, Sabonis, uh, they got their core scores. Those guys can, can you know, they, they'll be able to put points on the board. I do wonder if, um, you know, without Zion, if New Orleans can can score enough, period. Yeah, 
And that's, I mean, if you, their scores struggle. CJ McCollum struggling and Brandon Ingram. Yeah, that, that's the reality. And I mean, because if you're going to rely again on Herb Jones to be a really big player for you, Herb Jones is a good player, but you can't expect him to win you two play in games. And so I, it just feels like De'Aaron Fox and, and Demonis Sabonis will be able to will this team through. Keegan Murray looked really, really good against the Warriors, uh, where he struggled last year in that series. Hopefully, he'll be able to come out and play well again today. But yeah, Sacramento seems to be, the for me, that's the team that they just looked like they wanted it. And I don't know if that was that it was just that it was the Warriors and they felt disrespected last year and yeah, they wanted to go prove it was the Warriors. And can, are they going to not yeah. come out fired up for that? But it feels like, if they saw what happened and how fired up they were, it feels like they're going to do that again today. Uh, yeah, no, it's uh, and who was favored in that matchup? Did you say uh, Sacramento, Sacramento is favored? Sacramento, Sacramento is favored. Sacramento is favored. Um, all right, uh, yeah, you go. So uh, the breakdown of the play-in uh, games tonight, and then once, of course, that's decided, then over the weekend, all the official playoff matchups start. Which one of the playoff matchups to you, and how it might be here close to home, is most intriguing? of the uh the playoff matchups i know we don't have all of them set obviously but i don't know yeah those i mean it's it's anyway. gotta be the mavs and clippers right i i think you're right about that I saying, but it's probably close to home when you look at it the, the four or five because um, i mean i mean there's storylines you can find in all of them but if you say i genuinely can't call it now Kawhi leonard there's also a lot of questions about his health if you take him out it becomes a little bit easier on, on the mavs questionable then, for game one yeah he's questionable like for game one and there's i've read different things about you know that there's that he's not been ready, and Ty Lue's said he's preparing like he's gonna be ready. But then other people are saying, I don't know how he could be, but it's also Kawhi Leonard who keeps everything medically very close to the vest. And I don't mean that as two reporters; I mean that to his own teams. He won't tell them how he feels. He'll just wait until the day of, and if he shows up in in work clothes, if he shows up in a jersey, or if he shows up yeah, in, in street clothes, <laughs> you know he's gonna play or not. But like, like, please show up, please show up, please show up in work clothes. <laughs> so, uh, so you don't know. I, I mean, I it'll be questionable. I he's questionable game one. He, no matter what, I think you can see him. He'll be in by game two. Uh, but that would be really big for the Mavs to steal home court in one of these first two games. That'd be a big thing for them to be able to you know feel if you get a win in L.A. And you feel you can come back to Dallas and and, and get a win there, but that's probably got to be the most. I mean, like Lakers and Nuggets mm -hmm. is fun because it's a rematch of last year, but it doesn't feel like this Lakers team is as good as last year's team, and feels like Denver is going to be able to come through on that one. Like I want to watch Mavs, the Magic, and Cavaliers on the Eastern Conference because it is the future of the league in that in that. So you see a lot of young players that are going to be good in that series. Being Paolo Bancaro in his first playoff series will be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, 76ers Knicks will even be a little bit of fun with all the injuries. See if Joel Embiid can basically come back and will this team into a uh, a really yeah. good series. But I, so I think there's going to be good storylines throughout the playoffs. Uh, but yeah, if, if you say one series that I'm going to watch the most, it's to see if the Mavs can come out in this series and put it on the Clippers or if the Clippers are really this team, which because both of them are two, they're both teams that you say if healthy, Nobody really wants to face them, yeah, because they yep. just have uh, they have really good superstar players that when they show up and play their best, nobody on the nobody in the world wants to meet them, and so you're one of them's gonna you're, you're gonna have to end up playing one of them. Uh, Oklahoma City's got to play one of them, most likely Oklahoma City. We'll say uh, we'll have to play one of them at the one seed coming out of this series, but it, you know which one of them is really gonna show up. Which one of them is going to put it out? Is the defense of the Clippers going to be too much? Is J uh, Russell Westbrook coming off the bench going to be too much for the Mavs to handle? Or can that backcourt show up? And can P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford and, and Derek Lively and those bench players, you know, take it to a playoff level or do they disappear? Yeah, no, you're right about that. And what we've seen from the Mavs down the stretch which is where well, they, they, they had a 16 four stretch to end the season. And it's basically been because they have found a defensive identity. I mean, with Kyrie and Luke, I mean, they can, they can score. No doubt about it. You got two of the most skilled backcourt as <laughs> has been said most times in, in, in NBA history, maybe. Um, but that defensive, if you look at since the trade deadline, a one eleven um, defensive rating, according to cleaning the glass, that's seventh best. Uh, in the NBA in that time span. And that has really been one of the big differences for them. I mean, the Mavs were, they were allowing uh, 33% of the total shots near the rim before the trade deadline. 
Um, that was the 14th or 15th in the NBA, according to Clean the Glass. Um, since the trade deadline, that number's dipped to 30%. So that's eighth in the NBA. If you go look at pre-trade, opponent shot 68% at the rim, 28 in the league. Post-trade, that number has dropped to 59.8%, which is first in the league according to clean the glass. So their defense really has taken, uh, taken it to another level. Will that translate into the playoffs? You never know. Cause the regular season, the NBA playoffs are very, very different. They're, they're becoming, at least you're getting more competitive games down the stretch. So maybe yes. it, it does translate a little bit better because like we talked about yesterday, the play in has incentivized teams to play harder down the stretch, even if they're not necessarily in it, in it, or at the a championship contender, they still want to get in it. And there are more opportunities now for it. So, yeah. You have less teams um, tanking near the end of the season and, you know, exactly. trying to get those better draft odds that, you know, like that was a reality of before the play in, there was teams that were, you know, just the nine seed team was drastically trying to lose to the force to the, to the, ten, <laughs> the 12 seed team. And they're both like really, really trying to lose. And so you're you're seeing players play five minutes and it just sucks because you're two weeks out in the regular season and yeah. and people are still paying to go to these games. And exactly. basically ownership is saying, we do not care. Just bench all the players. We have to lose so we can get a star player in the draft because it's the cheapest yep. way to get a star player. It's it, so I, I think Adam Silver realizes you can't tr you can't ever expect people to do the right thing. You have to incentivize them and and find ways to make it. And so giving them the play in playoff games, maybe you'll host a game, maybe you'll be a part of it, helps incentivize it because you cannot trust people to do the right thing in, in today's society. Amen to that. That's so you can go real deep down there <laughs> in that rabbit hole right there. I totally agree. You can't, can't, hey, we love we love everybody, but can't trust everybody. That's why you put in guardrails and yeah. you put in you know uh, safeguards, checks and balances, just to make sure. Uh, and that's basically what the play it is, and it has worked. And you know what? It also tanks. It tanks your fantasy. And people think that's crazy, yeah. but I got friends who are big in fantasy. And fantasy yep. is huge, and you basically tank the fantasy world, which also tanks the all the basically your your analytical like your analytical fans or your data yes. scientist fans, which are there are a lot of those guys in, in every realm of sports. And baseball helped us, but baseball's had the oldest kind of data scientists and yeah. analytics in the analytical world. And once you tank the fantasy world, oh man, you'd be surprised how interest the buzz dies down yeah. for your sport. And that would happen to the NBA, like you said, like two weeks before the playoffs. Two weeks before and the playoffs. We yeah. don't, and then and then we don't talk about it enough because like well there's no competitive no. games going on it's nothing that's that, you no because we if, don't if, talk about if it before anyone in the top eight plays anyone that's below that it's a, it's a give me because yeah. they don't want it so these top teams are trying to win because they want to improve their seating and the teams below them are trying to lose to to lower their seating and it's yeah, yeah. it's it, it it just got really bad at a certain point in time and it I mean it hurts betting because you can't really you know, predict too. a game because you don't know who's going to play in it. Yeah, and there's all these point. random injuries that start mm. coming out. And it's hard to predict the game when when six start when five starters are out of the lineup. And you're like, well, the whole starting lineup is different. The entire starting lineup is different. That is good. That actually. Oh, that yeah, that might be the that might you might hit the nail on the head there. Actually, it's it, it affects yeah stuff I brought up, but the gambling too, yeah, because it that's got to be hell when they're just throwing random guys out there and yeah. minutes are unpredictable. It might take some of those off the board potentially. Like now, I'm taking yeah. it off the board because we just don't know everything, which is bad for the league and it's bad for uh for betting overall too. Great point. Uh, all right, uh, we'll get back to the NBA playoffs. So I want to kind of break down some of these matchups a little bit and maybe break down uh the uh, the Mavs and the Clippers a little bit later on. Um, but I'm with you. I think that Knicks Philly matchup is is really intriguing depending on the health of 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 Joel Embiid of course. But I think that is a a could be end up being a really thrilling matchup. I know it's a 7 versus a 2, but I think matchup wise it could be it could be something. And the Knicks had been good forever and the Knicks are good again uh which I think is really good for the NBA when the Knicks are good now uh, it's been a long time actually since the Knicks have been this good are we talking about like basically since like the Jordan days since the Knicks have been this good yeah no no uh post Jordan when the Spurs won the championship in, ni in 99 yeah, right. they played the Knicks in the finals so around that so so around what's your deal I mean that's yeah, a good I, mean, I think, the I think they're better than the Carmelo Anthony Knicks I think so like but, that Carmelo, yeah, that Carmelo. Yeah. I want to see, how, I see how good those were. I don't know if they ever got. I gotta see if they ever got a top seed or something. You're yeah, right. there was a Carmelo couple that were okay, but they just never really performed. I, I, Jalen Brunson just got the city of buzz, though. Dude, Jalen Brunson is balling. Man. He's 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 averaging 
20, he's averaging damn near 29 points per game and, and he's shooting close to 48% overall this season from the field, 40% from three point range. I mean, he's just, yeah, he's a beast. Yes. And he's got a, even Larry David was talking about, there's a Larry David piece of audio <laughs> talking about Jalen Brunson. So he said how he yes. slithers into the lane. When he was on uh, Rich Eisen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. And yes. And then he, <laughs> we were about to find that cut because that was, uh, that was actually pretty good. Uh, all right. Uh, let, we'll go behind the burn orange curtain next. We're going to discuss uh, Texas, um, Texas potentially acquiring multiple D tackles in the transfer report. I remember Bobby Burton said he could see two, he could see them taking two. D tackles in the transfer portal. I don't know what that says about the evaluation of the guys they have on campus right now. We'll talk about it, uh, but they, it, I love how aggressive Texas is being in filling holes on the roster. If you can do it, why not exhaust every possible means to fill a hole on your roster when you feel like you can make a run? Um, and Texas feels like this is a year where they can make a run. Remember, Tech, uh, Sark told Chris Lowe that he believes they're on the cusp of an epic run. All right. Well, don't let one hole on your on your roster or one position that's a liability potentially. Don't let that end up dragging down all right, your entire season. And I think that's what this move may be about. If indeed they are going uh, to be that aggressive in the transfer portal um, at the D tackle position. So we'll come back and discuss it. We'll talk about the uh, potential uh, options for Texas at D tackle in the transfer portal. There are already been some reports. Uh, we'll get into that. We'll also hear from one of the Texas players. Uh, he, uh, there was a media availability, Malik Muhammad, uh, Baron Sorrell, as well as Alfred Collins spoke to the media yesterday. So we'll hear from Malik Muhammad. He had a couple of interesting uh, tidbits that I thought we should uh, present to you guys. So we'll get into that, have a Texas football conversation, talk about spring practice a little bit as well. All of that and more when we return right here on the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Mohan Rod Babers coming back on the horn.
All right, let's uh, dive into some uh, Texas football conversation. Uh, my friend uh, Bobby Burton over at Owen Texas Football uh, on our live stream the other day, he said that he believes Texas could take uh, two D tackles, as many as two D tackles potentially, in the transfer portal in this spring window. And wow, I was I was like I I, I, I thought that we take one. Maybe they already took Savelle, so they already they already took one uh, D tackle. Um, but he said he thinks they could end up taking two if. The, they had guys who fit the system and and guys who are the right fit for what Texas needs. And what they need is a D tackle that can play the A gap. They need a D tackle um, that can be a kind of an A gap disruptor for them. Someone who can be a, a true nose tackle. Now they it, it helps if they can play multiple shades up front. Or they need someone who can be a true nose tackle. And some of the guys in the portal um, they do fit that description. Uh, Bill Norton is a defensive tackle from Arizona. And the reason that is important because Johnny Nansen, who is the new co-DC and linebackers coach, um, he was at Arizona. Remember, uh, Tia Savea came from Arizona. So that'd be another guy that you bring in from Arizona who knows Johnny Nansen's system already. Johnny Nansen's familiar with them, um, familiar with their skill set. So the transition should be pretty easy. You're uh, trying in terms of the vetting process for the young man. That should be pretty easy as well because of the familiarity um, with each other. So that is probably the most likely option. And my man CJ Vogel reported that he is going to be on campus for the spring game. So the Texas is already working on him and he 50% of his snaps were played in the a gap. Uh, Tia Zavea, like, oh, sorry, Bill Norton, 50% of his snaps were played uh, in the a gap. So he's, he's got an a gap B gap guy that can play it for you. Um, and there's familiarity with the system that w- and he's already coming in. That one makes a lot of sense. And he would be um, a grad transfer as well. Um, So he'd have a one year of eligibility remaining. Uh, Also, there is another defensive lineman in the transfer portal right now, Dominic Williams. He's from TCU. uh, And he's already told on three sports that he has set up his five. Actually, I take it. Yeah, actually going to be six visits. Uh, Oklahoma, uh, Texas, Colorado, LSU, Missouri and Oregon. Um, he's got, he had 60 tackles, nine and a half tackles for loss and four and a half sacks in his time at TCU. He would be the prize. Um, from what I'm told, he's got in two seasons at TCU, he said six, he's got 28 defensive stops, 30 quarterback pressures, three quarterback hits, 10 tackles for loss. This is a guy who has a high ceiling in a, a Sunday skill set. Um, and by the way, a little background, Six foot two, 320 pounds. Um, and he actually is from Torrance, California. And if that sounds familiar, that's because that's Sark's hometown. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know if there's a, I don't know how big that place is. I have no idea. Um, I imagine, you know, Sark knows somebody who knows somebody that can get close to the young man. So he's already said he visits to Texas. So throws that, throw that out there. He, um, is, I think, one of the better. D tackles in the transfer portal. If I had to choose one out of all of them, that's the one that you would choose. And 53% of his snaps of his 477 snaps were in the a gap. Kind of unique, right? He's an a gap disruptor, a guy who can be a run stopper, but also a guy who can um, penetrate, reset the line of scrimmage for you and make some plays in the backfield. So he's another one. And the other one um, is a UCLA defensive tackle. Uh, Jay Toya, I believe is his name. And if I mispronounced it, I, I apologize. Um, but he is now uh, hitting the transfer portal. He put this out there via Twitter as I prepare to graduate from UCLA. After speaking with my parents, and my family, I decided to enter the NCAA transfer portal as of last night. And uh, he is a guy that, according to Pro Football Focus, um, he, he played 154 of his 383 snaps in the A gap. Um, although, um, you know, he's so he, He's he's a guy that's got uh, experience there, and he when he was at UCLA, he spent the 2021 season playing for Johnny Danson. Actually, um, so when Jan, Johnny Danson was the uh, obviously the, he moved on to Arizona, but he spent 
that he spent time at UCLA and, and that's where Johnny Nansen was. So Johnny Nansen's connections could single handedly help you solve your D tackle issues this upcoming season. That is a hell of a coincidence. I mean, you talk about serendipitous. That is crazy. You bring in Johnny Nansen, that helps you get Savea at D tackle because you need him because you lose Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat. Helps you get Savea. He also has a connection with Billy Norton. He can help you get not Billy, Bill Norton, and help you get Bill Norton. And also with this kid, Jay Toya, because he was uh, the linebackers coach there at UCLA, I believe, and played one season there. Isn't that crazy? That's yeah. wild. They, it's all about who you know. It's right? all about who you know. You know. That is that is that is that is unbelievable. So, all these guys who have a connection with Johnny Nansen, um, hopefully they think fondly of him, and he get uh, their glowing reports about uh, how great of a guy he is and what a connection he has with the players. And if that's the case, then you know you might be able to, like I said, solve all your issues, your D tackle issues, because of Johnny Nansen connections. Uh, yeah, Johnny Nansen was the D-line coach at UCLA in 2020 and 2021 before he moved on to Arizona to become the NCAA. This is what I loved about Johnny Nansen's resume. This is what I love about Johnny Nansen's resume. It's Belichickian. What do I say about Belichickian? It's a coach who has experience in more than one phase of the game. Most coaches, they spend their entire careers, 30, 40 years of coaching in just one phase of the game. This, they, it, a lot of them coach just one position and it's fine. You want to become a, you know, an expert in that position, in that field, in that, in that phase. Um, but I think if you want to be a, a head coach, I think it helps to have um, a well-rounded knowledge of football in more than one phase of the game and at different positions. And that's kind of what I would look for when I'm hiring a head coach. I want somebody who's, who's been in different meeting rooms, different phases of the game. He kind of understands the culture of those. Um, he was a, and I, I want to I think about the highest levels, not at the high school level, nothing against high school, but at the college and the pro level is really the criteria. He was at Montana State. He was a running back coach, went to Idaho State, cornerback coach, Idaho State, DB coach, Idaho. He was a linebackers coach and special teams coach, uh, went to Idaho, uh, was also a D-line coach at Idaho, special teams coach, went to Washington, D-line, special teams coach, uh, also running back, special teams coach at, at uh, Washington, USC, became running backs coach and special teams coach, also linebackers coach at USC, uh, inside linebackers coach at USC, D-line coach at UCLA, D.C. at Arizona, and inside linebackers coach, and now the Texas Code DC and inside linebackers coach. Dude's been, I've been everywhere where, man. I love, I, I love a resume <laughs> like that. I mean, there's only a few positions that he hasn't coached. I mean, that guy's got a well rounded knowledge of football. Um, and Texas is lucky to have him on the staff and obviously got a lot of connections because of that. So, um, we'll see what Texas does. But like I said, my friend Bobby Burn over on Texas believes that Texas could bring in multiple, uh, two D tackles potentially, um, in this transfer portal window. You know, if they if they bring into it, just I'm not saying it's an indictment on the 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 guys they have here now, Patrick, but it would show you that the, they haven't necessarily earned the trust of the coaches that they're going to be yeah. able to to fill that that void that's left by Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat. Yeah, it is, and I mean, it's it's you know, you unfortunately get to those parts where you say we would love to develop and and have the opportunity to take a year, and we think in one year you guys could be ready to be star players and but you're not right now, and we we play Michigan week two, and they're gonna what? try and run on us, <laughs> and what? so so we we don't want to lose week two, so we kind of got to go find some guys that maybe could help us out and and throw some more uh just a little bit more ammo, just a few more guns in the it, fight, yeah. yeah, just chunking just chunking bodies at it, and hopefully you find a solution. And yeah, I mean that's the truth. That's I. I and I'm glad the coaches are looking at it that way. Uh, I've been talking about talking about it for a while. This team is gonna be good, um, but I, the the way to beat Texas would be just to run the ball on them. They got they're gonna have great edges this year. Um, I think the secondary is gonna be a strength this year. Um, they're gonna have a lot of speed at linebacker with Anthony Hill out there um, and David Benda. But Anthony Hill, he's basically the hybrid guy, right? He's he's young. Too. He's young. He, he's young and he hasn't necessarily learned how to play the linebacker position at the most elite level. He's just a great elite athlete out there playing linebacker right now. And so that makes up for a lot of mistakes. But if you want to attack, you want to uh, challenge his uh, technical proficiency <laughs> at playing the linebacker position, you want to run at him. Because even Michael Parsons, an elite athlete out there playing linebacker, 
when they run at him and they challenge his fundamental technical proficiency at linebacker, taking on blocks to the right uh, shoulder, um, being able to use leverage, even he becomes an average run defender. Um, but he's an elite athlete yeah. when you put him in space and make him a pass rusher. So is Anthony Hill. So to negate Anthony Hill's elite presence, I would run on Texas. And to negate the edges, I would run up the middle on Texas. And to control the football so I don't have to give the football to Sark's uh, prolific offense, I want to control the ball and just convert. <clears throat> and I w- three yards in a cloud of dust, I'm running right up the middle on Texas because I don't have to worry about Devondre Sweat and Byron Murphy anymore. And that's where you would attack them. You just run power and you run gap schemes on Texas as much as you can. And Michigan can do it with success because they got the bodies and the big humans. Georgia probably could do it. And maybe a couple of other teams in the SEC that could do it. Not many teams could do it. So the Texas flaw, it won't be exposed by everybody because everybody just can't yeah. do it. Texas, <clears throat> Texas would overwhelm them athletically <clears throat> and schematically. But a few teams will, and a few teams that will may keep you from uh, achieving your goals, which are SEC title game and competing for a championship. All right, uh, to compete for a championship, they're going to need the secondary to play really well. And that means – you're going to need a uh, young Manny Muhammad to step up. And he spoke with the media yesterday and uh, he had some interesting things to say. And I, I thought it really revealed a lot about his uh, football character. Um, it's the first time he has actually met with the media. So he was asked, he was asked about, uh, you know, what he's uh, been working on uh, in his game um, and how he's in, and what he's improved on in his game. Um, here's uh, Manny Muhammad for Texas. I don't want to say I've been playing for a long time, but I've been playing a position uh, since I was like in sixth grade. Uh, and I had a uh, very great uh, high school coaches. Uh, and then, you know, we got the bloodline of corners uh, in my family. Um, but I always want to put God first because without him, I, I, I can't achieve none of this. Um, and then like just knowing the game, learning the game. And then that's that's really it. Um, I thought it was interesting that he says he's been playing since the sixth grade. You know, a lot of guys, they haven't played the cornerback position or any specific position that long. When you're in high school, you're a great athlete. Move you around, you play you wherever you want to, and then you get projected to play a certain position. Um, he had the luxury because he played at a, um, a really elite <clears throat> high school football program where, and, and even, you know, I think the feeder programs, um, to that high school where he was able to just play one position and they didn't necessarily have him moving around playing, you know, wide receiver and playing running back. And now as, as a sophomore in college, you go look at, it, he's been playing now the cornerback position for, what, eight years <laughs> um, already? Um, by the time I got to the sophomore in, in college, I had been playing the cornerback position, I think, for like six years, maybe something like that. I've uh, been playing it since my my freshman year of high school. Maybe in eighth grade, I started playing it a little bit, but exclusively. So he's actually, a, a, in terms of being a student of the game, he's a student of the position. And he's he's been able to have kind of a mastery um, of the cornerback position already because he's played it for a long time. And from what I hear, he has studied it and he is a, a considers himself a technician at the cornerback position. And I do, I jump watching his game. I do think he's kind of a technician of the game. And it makes sense because he's played it for a long time. He's played that position for a long time. Yeah, makes sense. That. Yeah, um, I didn't realize that. Okay. Um, also, another, here's another cut too. He was asked about spring ball and where he's improved his game the most uh, during spring football. Here is what uh, Manny Bum had to say. I like to work on uh, everything in my game uh, as far as my area quickness, um, stand up field on the top shoulder, uh, tackling my angles, um, knowing when and knowing where my help is, when I can. Uh, break on certain routes uh, when I can play high sometimes. See, the reason that cut is important, and he, he did, he's not going to play like this, but I will. He's, he's describing at the end of that cut when he can cheat. He's like, I got to know where it's my true. help is. <laughs> it's true. Right? He's like, and then I got to know when I can go underneath and when I'm over the top. Because he's a ball hawk. Yeah. That's how he sees the world. So he's basically describing, like, I just got to know when I can cheat. Like, oh, I got help on the inside? Oh, man, I'm about to undercut any – I'm about to, uh, you know, break on any outside route early. Um, You know what I mean? Like, he he you can tell that's the way he sees it. And that's why I played that – I love that he's like, I got to know where my help is. That's important to him. 
Yeah. And that's why you talk about the upfield shoulder, too, because the upfield shoulder is important. Because if you stay on the upfield shoulder, and a lot of the Texas cornerbacks do not, you have a chance to play the football. That's, you have a chance to become the receiver. I, I got to know what I'm not going to get yelled at by coach. Yes. yes. That's what I got to learn. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I love him. He thinks like a ball hawk. He yeah. really, really does. Um, uh, CJ Vogel asked him a really good question too, because uh, him and John Tay Cook have been friends for a long time, going back to their time in high school, and now they're teammates here uh, at Texas. And he talked about their unique relationship and how they help uh, really feed off one another and help improve each other's game. Here is uh, Malik Muhammad. I mean, we always. I mean. During practice, we'll be talking to each other like, ah, what did I do wrong right here? Like, if he'll beat me, he'll be like, ah, you should have did this better. Or if I um, win on a rep, I'll be like, I should have did this better. That's how you could have got me right here. And then after practice, we'll do the same thing and then just laugh about it. And then we'll watch tape together like when we go in the cold tubs and the hot tubs. It is uh, it is so true. It's crazy. I literally remember those conversations with, with guys like Chris Sims, Guys like you know, Montreal Flowers, like good friends of mine, Kyle Shanahan, who's an offensive guy, good friends of mine, who when we had reps against each other, after they won a rep or I won a rep, there would be an exchange about, oh, man, you know, if you had gave me one more stutter step or you'd have looked me off the other way, I I was looking at your eyes and I saw your eyes. Your eyes went to the route. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, and you would have, have these exchanges and you go, oh, okay. And these are little bits of information to help you improve. They're, they're just little small critiques. Yeah. Before you get into the film room, like, okay, yeah. And and helping you improve the process. It is, I, I'm glad he described it. You can tell this, this young man is cerebral in yes. his game. Just small little answers, but if you pick it apart, he's, he's very cerebral in his game. That's why I played some of these guys. I really love uh, some of his answers. Um, he also talked about uh, Makuba uh, and, and Andrew Makuba and his uh, contribution to the secondary so far. I like what he says about Andrew Makuba. Listen to his description about uh, Makuba's game. Uh, Makuba has came along re really well. Uh, I think he's going to be a big player for us in, in, in a back end. Uh, he communicates well. Uh, and then sometimes when he's such a bet, sometimes when uh, someone does something wrong, he'll make them right. Oh, did you pick up on that? That's good. And when somebody's wrong, he'll make you right. Oh, I love guys like that. That's a guy that's, uh, you know, that's the, the, the CYA guy. He, and so he'll cover yours too. And uh, I had safeties like that. Ahmad Brooks was like that uh, for me in the secondary. Um, there are other guys, they're kind of an eraser, eraser of mistakes of guys in the secondary. And I love the way he put that up. And it makes sense, right? He's played for Clemson. This guy's played in. Uh, critical moments on the biggest stages and he's a veteran you know and even though he may not know the defense in and out he's he's seen everything he's you know there's really no combination of personnel groupings or formation that he hadn't seen he's such a he's like, oh i i kind of know what they're trying to achieve here i got it i got it i got it i got the gist of it he's a cliff notes guy at this point it's all he needs yeah no, that. And I think, that. I, you know, and the, the fact of being able to sit back there and when somebody messes up something in front of him, he goes, no, I, I saw what happened and I saw <laughs> what you did wrong. <laughs> I saw, yeah, exactly. I knew it, but I had your back. Don't worry. I got you. I knew it was like, oh, that's going to be a busted play. If you don't, let me, let me squeeze. Let me go over here. Let me change my leverage point a little bit. Let me cheat over here a little mm -hmm. bit because I know I can do this with my, I can handle my responsibility, but also cover your butt. Yeah, yeah. Just that, you just that, what is he doing up there? Yeah, oh, no. Yeah, exactly. no, no. You're supposed to be dropping. What are you? Why are you? Oh, God. Okay, <laughs> all right. I got it. Yeah. See, you, man, trust me. There are lots of guys like that on in every sport, by the way. Uh, you got guys like that on your team that are really, really important. All right. Yeah, good stuff there. Uh, we got some other uh, cuts. We'll play get to the break we got the big fat poll of the day coming up and also uh we'll start getting to our musically themed day of the week because it's 512 friday right here on the broadcast featuring patrick davis i'm like my longhorn rod babies coming right back on the horn
Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Now, you've heard me brag about Dr. Greg Eckert and his all-star team, and for good reason. Actually, I owe them a huge debt of gratitude. When I first, when I went in there uh, most recently um, for a just a simple checkup to get the teeth cleaned, it had been a while, but I wanted to make sure I was staying on top of my oral health and uh, oral hygiene. Well, they actually did a great job. They also did such a good job. They actually found that my wisdom teeth have been growing in sideways. Uh, they thought it could present uh, a uh, dire situation situation potentially for me. And he wanted to make sure they took care of that before it became a disastrous situation. And that's exactly what they did. They, and they eased me, uh, they eased my anxiety about the, the process and the procedure, informed me and educated me about every detail of it. Um, got it done. I was back at work within a couple of days. Uh, and now I owe a huge debt of gratitude uh, to Dr. Uh, Yu and his wonderful staff. And my uh, dental health has never been better. And I encourage you, no matter what it is, maybe it is something as dire as having all of your wisdom them teeth removed like I did, or something as simple as just getting a, a simple cleaning or uh, a checkup or teeth whitening, dentures, porcelain crowns, veneers, dental implants, uh, full mouth reconstruction, even root canal therapy, whatever it takes to ensure you're getting the best quality dental care available. That's what matters to Dr. Greg Eckert and his fa his fantastic staff. And um, Dr. Yu is always, you know, uh, on the cutting edge of the technological advances in uh, general dentistry. He's, he's got an intellectual curiosity that he's got to feed, but it's good for you because right now, now, because of that, he can give you a brand new smile in just one day, permanently secure to your dental implants. No time spent without teeth. You'll get temporary fixtures and stay complete your permanent smile, but you're going to smile again with confidence and eat freely without pain or discomfort. So we're talking about a lifelike permanent solution. So if you've been told your teeth need, be, need to be replaced, don't freak out. Just call Dr. Greg Ecker today. I know it sounds too good to be true. It's not. It's just Dr. U. 512-345-3166. That's 512-345-3166 or visit DrEcker.com. R U E C K E R T dot com. Back in the broadcast on a Friday morning. That means it's a 512 Friday where we play local music that you can go check out around town all weekend long. This is White Label Analog. They're playing tonight at ABGB, the Austin Beer Garden and Brewery 
that you can check out down there on uh, Old Torf and South Lamar right over there. You can go find that out and uh, enjoy some pizza and some beer and some good music from White Label Analog uh, tonight there uh, at the ABGB. Good stuff there. We'll keep playing uh, local music all for you all throughout the show. But let's get to the big fat poll of the day. 512-447-3776 is the text line number. Patrick's big fat poll of the day on the horn. All right. Let's keep it simple because spring games tomorrow. And uh, we're hoping that we're all going to go enjoy it. Enjoy it. The weather will hold off enough. I saw CDC post about it yesterday that he says, should be some early showers, and they're hoping that everything will be after the spring game uh, is when the rain is what they have heard with their the, the Texas meteorologists have said so far. Uh, if it's anything like last night, that would be great. Where last night I was seeing, so I was going to bed. It was supposed to be raining all night, so I moved some stuff inside, and then there was no rain. So hopefully, hopefully it is more. Oh, yeah, than, I saw that. There was like an interruption on like the the TV shows, like on the local news too. They thought it was going to be something. I, well, I didn't get any. And I, I saw it. I saw right it on my because I checked the weather because I was looking at Saturday's yeah. weather last night, and then it was like, all right, like ten o'clock, eleven o'clock overnight. It's gonna thunderstorms, crazy storms, and then it apparently did not happen. I slept through it if it did. Happen. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went outside this morning. No, it was dry. It was dry. Yeah, yeah, it was dry as a bone. So I did not need to move stuff inside. But uh, <laughs> the question, is big, sorry, big five fall of the day goes up on the tech side. Who will be the standout player of the orange and white game? Who will be the standout player for Texas in the spring game? Who is the one that you think will stand out above all else? Could it be Manny Muhammad we just saw? Does he get does he get a turnover in the game and stand out defensively? Doesn't allow anything big? Is it one of the wide receivers, John T. Cook, Isaiah Bond? Does that one of those guys step up and become make some big plays downfield? Does Arch Manning steal the show and get some more playing time this year? And everybody, we start the quarterback controversy all over again. And everybody <laughs> freaks out that Arch Manning, how could he not be playing? And it becomes a national news cycle for the next week. It could be. It could be. Does one of the running backs break off a bit, a couple big runs? CJ Baxter, Jaden Blue, do they break off a big run? Who do you think is going to be the standout player for the spring game tomorrow? Yeah, because the truth is, guys like Quinn aren't going to play much. Like your frontline yeah. starters aren't going to play much. CJ Baxter is not going to play much. Guys, you know, are proven commodities who've earned the trust of the coaches. They're not going to play much. And why would they? So there'll be a group of guys that won't even play. As, they'll play two or three series, but they won't yeah. play uh, the bulk of the spring game. So it'll be one of the, you know, with the guys who are battling for more spots to trying to earn more playing time. It'll be one of those players. Interesting. Let's see here. It could be one of those wide receivers, though, because I think they'll play a lot. They actually. will, because I know, like, oh, A.D. No. Mitchell, to me, last year was one of those guys that you saw A.D. Mitchell and went, okay, that guy's better than I – like, we knew he was going to be good, but you saw some of the things he did in the game and thought, oh, he could, okay. be, a, he could be a real big threat for us, and then, of course, was. <laughs> yes. No, I agree with that. I think there will be some guys that pop. Um, initially for you, because your question about who's going to be, I mean, it could be a defensive guy. It could be, I mean, somebody gets a turnover. Um, you know, Manny Muhammad apparently has been for, getting takeaways in practice or, you know, a guy gets multiple sacks. We talked about those edge defenders. I'd say a guy like Colin Simmons or a guy like Trey Moore. Yeah. Um, is getting in the backfield, wreaking havoc. Where well, the coach has got to blow the whistle all the time. Like, all right, man, this guy's in the backfield all the damn time. He's got BGO. Some guys are going to look different out there. We, cause we haven't seen him. So, that's a good question. I have to think about that. Um, yeah, Anthony Hill. I, I can see it being. I can see it being run the running backs, man. Yeah, I think one like of the running, running backs, backs is a good one. I Trey Wisner might be a sleeper pick could because be. of what we've heard about him. I think yep. he could get some good a good amount of snaps. Yep. And so if he gets a good amount and breaks a couple of those off, that could be a big one. Uh, DeAndre Moore. DeAndre Moore's another one. Yeah, you're right. Because he, he'll probably really play a decent amount of minutes because he's yeah. stepping into that role, and they'll see what he can do. And I could believe that he'd have a good, uh, you know, a good, uh, uh, he'd have a good connection with Arch Manning. Yeah, I think Longhorn fans just like it to be Arch. It'd be great if it was just. Arch. That's and it could be. I mean, we it all could, we would love it if it was simple. Arch. Yeah, if he that, if he yeah. dominates and just throws, you know, throws. now you don't want the defense to get killed, but you'd like it if he was really good. <laughs> you'd like it he, if he was really good. Um, yeah, I mean, the spring game is always had glass half full, right? Glass half empty, depending yep. on how you look at it. Because, yeah, if one side of the ball is doing good or one player is doing good, I mean, that's at the expense of another. Uh, but 
yeah, I mean, I think Logan fans will love to see Arch have a really good spring game and him to be considered the t- the talk of the spring game because you know Quinn is the starter now. We uh, nationally they would talk some nonsense, but we know locally yeah, yeah. Quinn's the guy. But Arch is going to play. Um, just, unfortunately, just because of what history suggests and Quinn's history, injury history, he hasn't started and finished every game and what since his sophomore year. Texas in the last 25 years, they've had seven seasons where a quarterback has started and finished every game. I mean, that's I mean that's the exception and not the rule. And hell, even since Sark has been here, Sark hadn't had a quarterback start and finish every game. It hadn't yeah. happened for Sark. So I, I just the odds are Arch is gonna play. I'd like for Arch to look good in the spring. Oh, yeah. You want to yeah. see the improvement of like and I mean it wasn't really bad last year, but again, last year was he was he still should have been in high school pretty much. Pretty much. And so it was something where you looked at him last year and said, okay, he's not, but he's definitely playing up a level. And this year you'd like to see him step in and look like a guy who could step in and be a quarterback for you. If, if the situation arose. Yes. And you hope it never rises, knock on wood, but chances are it will. Uh, All right. uh, I'm going to have an answer for the, uh, the big fat poll today on the other side. I got to think about that a little bit. Who's going to be, so what's the, is who's going to be like your, the MVP of the spring game for you or your standout. I I said standout because MVP feels like it's really hard to quantify. It is. So I said standout is, is kind of a, is a cop out of not saying MVP, but your standout. And then we'll ask you on Monday too. We'll ask you who was the standout, who was your standout. So I can already tell you what the poll will be on Monday. Will be who was your standout. But this will we'll, we'll judge we'll judge our results based on what we thought we were going to see versus what we do see. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with you on that. Yeah, Monday everybody everybody understands the assignment. <laughs> All right, <laughs> see the guy, who who stood out, who separated, who elevated at the spring game. All right, we come back. We'll get into some NFL discussion. Um, we got Raj Rant on the other side. Uh, we'll also talk about the. There are some rumors, salacious gossip that may be affecting the draft stock of a couple of Longhorns coming out. We'll discuss that, too. Bucky Brooks has his top five players at every position. Longhorns are getting some love there. And CBS Sports ranked the top 100 players in college football for the 2024 season. We'll dive into that as well. All of that and more right here on the broadcast uh, coming back uh, featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babies on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Austin is a great city, even with the traffic. Uh, but uh, the reason for the traffic is because people keep moving to Austin. They love this city just as much as we do. And as the city continues to grow and thrive, uh, so do our friends over at Iron Workers Local Union 482. And many of the iconic landmarks that you are driving by right now or actually maybe parked in front of right now in traffic are actually built and constructed by the hands and the skilled craftsmanship of Iron Workers Local Union 482, like the Pennybacker Bridge and DKR State. Them. Uh, the folks over at Iron Workers Local 42 don't just go to the office, they build it. So if you're looking for an exciting employment opportunity or you're looking for a refreshing career change, right now is the perfect time for you to become a member of Iron Workers Local 482. Uh, right now, they're hiring over 3,000 people for a huge project right here in Central Texas. Uh, they're offering competitive benefits, competitive wages. They offer a pension plan. And they offer training for unskilled labor through their apprenticeship program. Become a member of Iron Workers Local 482 and take pride in the type of team work and craftsmanship that helps shape the future of our great city. Uh, it's a pretty easy process. All you got to do is go online today and apply at ironworkers482.org. Uh, that's ironworkers482.org.
Welcome back to the Rodcast. It is a 5-1-2 Friday. That's where my man Patrick uh, plays jams from local bands and artists that you have a chance to catch live right here in the ATX. Who are we jamming right now, Patrick? This is Vallejo, and they're playing Saturday mm-hmm. special show at Regal Rooms, new room down there on Man Shack, set up just for doing shows with good lighting and good setup and everything. Got some VIP stuff there, too. A cool little new room they set up down there on, on Man Shack down south so nice. if you want to go check out vallejo after the spring game go check him out tomorrow night or saturday like yeah it's morning uh i used to live over there by uh man check man check and salada yep it's right down there it's right down that area it's right down yeah. there mm-hmm. uh, I'm, I, I, i've never been to that spot but it, it's there, it's relatively new it's relatively new okay there you go uh my man patrick always hooking you up on a five one two friday uh so you can sound real cool in front of all your friends uh knowing where all of these really talented folks are going to be playing over the weekend um also uh coming up a little bit later on the show uh and i said we'll get back to it we'll talk more texas spring football which is also of course happening this weekend but here we'll talk some uh texas football specifically but we'll dive into the uh some draft reports uh that are coming out and, and these are more salacious than anything, um, but are coming from scouts um, and about some of the uh, the Longhorns. And I want to get into those a little bit because I think some of these could be dropping the draft stock of some Longhorns. And as there are a couple of actually that may be helping uh, draft the draft stock of these Longhorns. But I think uh, there are some guys whose draft stock may be falling as a result of uh, some of these reports. So we'll get into that too coming up here in just a second. Also, we'll uh, have Raj Rant. Raj Rant also will be spring football related. We'll talk about what you're likely to see uh, conceptually, schematically in the spring game. We know that Sark's not going to reveal too much. Uh, that's the way spring games work out. Uh, but you will see some of the staples, some of the go-to uh, concepts from Sark, and we'll talk about what those are um in um in raj rant we go uh, into raj rant and we'll get into that too and we'll talk some of the uh college football top 100 players cbs sports has a ranking of the top 100 players uh in college football and we'll talk about where the longhorns or uh where the longhorns land on that uh list of the top 100 players in college football we'll get into that too coming up here so we got a lot that we're going to dive into uh first my man patrick will get us caught up on the big headlines of the day uh, with our horn headlines, uh, we'll do that first, and then we'll dive into uh, the other topics. So, uh, if you will, Patrick, please do us a service, uh, hit us with the horn headlines, and get us updated on the top headlines of the day. All right, your horn headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Texas baseball will look to get their season back on the right track with their weekend series with TCU starting tonight. The Longhorns are 1-4 and four in series openers in Big 12 play this season, not winning an opening game since Texas Tech March 8th. But Texas pitching will hope to get a break against a team that has not scored more than four runs in a game since March. Texas softball will take their record of six straight wins against ranked teams to Kansas this weekend to take on the Jayhawks. Sophomore catcher Reese Abb will, will look to make history as she is only six RBIs away from setting the single-season RBI record at Texas. In the NBA, the final play-in games will be settled tonight with the Bulls taking on the Heat and the Kings facing the Pelicans. Both Jimmy Butler and Zion Williamson will have, will miss their respective games due to injuries suffered in the 7 versus 8 matchups. Despite the injuries, the Heat are still favored to beat the Bulls. However, Sacramento gets a slight edge against New Orleans. In Major League Baseball, the Rangers withstood a tough first outing for rookie Jack Leiter, who gave up seven earned runs in three and two-thirds innings to win 9-7 to seven and win the series against the Tigers. In action starting today, the Astros will start a series with the Nationals and with Justin Verlander returning from injury, and the Rangers will begin their series with the Braves with pregame beginning at 545 right here on the Horn, and that is your Horn Headlines. Thank you, Patrick, for the Horn Headlines. And, yes, I forgot about the Rangers report, which is also yes. coming up in the 9 o'clock. I apologize, Rangers fans. We got a Rangers report coming up in 9 o'clock. And that, that series is huge. Uh, Rangers fans should be excited about that uh, series versus the uh, uh versus the Braves because uh, that's a big time series. Braves are just uh, really impressive and they are starting out. They started out this season with a bang, especially offensively. So we'll talk about that coming up in the nine o'clock with your Rangers report. I apologize. Didn't mention that earlier in the show. Uh, sorry. So let's get to because of these draft uh, reports. Remember we played the sound of Deion Sanders and Deion said, 
Uh, he knows because he used to work the draft that there are definitely teams out there that leak information before the draft to try to drop the draft stock of players. Uh, some of it may be true. Some of it partially true. Some of it just straight up false, just straight up yes. fake news that they're just leaking out there. And it's specifically to drop the draft stock of players. And it is that's a dirty game. Um, but Dion said uh, it, it definitely does happen because he remembers working the draft and it happened that way. And I, I think right now it's happening to a couple of Longhorns. Now, Tavondre Sweat, you, you can make the argument that, hey, man, this is Tavondre Sweat's on doing because of the DWI charge. Uh, and, 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 yep, I totally get that. He made a bad decision. There's no doubt. Um, but since that DWI charge, man, the reports about Tavondre Sweat um, and just the other issues and the red flags prior to the DWI arrest, they're dropping his draft stock uh, right now precipitously. And I got this report from – this is from Daniel Jeremiah. Uh, remember, we had the um, we uh, had the Field Yates Mel Kuyper draft, Mel, mock draft that we went through last week. It was a three-round mock draft, yeah. and we went through all the Longhorns, no Tavondre Sweat, even yep. in their, their, their three-round mock draft. And uh, basically, Daniel Jeremiah said he'd be shocked to see Tavondre Sweat go in, in the first two rounds and believes that round three is the earliest – with a legitimate chance that the tackle is still available on D on day three. Um, he says here that uh, he was asked a question on a Q and a about Tavondre sweat. He said, I'm curious how far you think Tavondre sweat falls with the DUI. What kind of organization would be the best fit with that kind of red flag? Um, whether it's a no nonsense head coach, a veteran locker room, or, you know, obviously a player's coach. He says here, that's a good question. I think it's going to be different around the league. I think the answer to that question has to do with whether people agree with it or not. How good of a football player do you think he is? I don't know how many teams were as high on him as a player. He wasn't in my top 50, he says. Um, and basically he goes on to say to me, the third round would be the earliest I could see him going. Um, but he said, I wouldn't be shocked if he didn't go on day two and ended up going somewhere on day number three. So they got to Andre Sweat potentially drop into the third round and then potentially drop into the fourth round. I, like I said, I say a team will trade for him, but, but before he drops that far, I think what they'll go, Oh man, this is too this is too good of a bargain, too good of a value. This guy won the Outland Trophy for being the best interior D lineman in the country. So something we need. If they de- you yeah, know, if they need for so need, many teams. Yeah. That's why I say I, I think he I I think ultimately right, right, right now with D tackle becoming a premium position in the NFL now too. Half of the highest paid uh defensive players, if you look at the top 12 to top 15 highest paid players in the league are now interior D linemen. Um, who can potentially be a, a force run defender and also be a guy that can be a, a, a pass rusher as well. He fits that mode, and you would get him on the cheap. If he doesn't work out and you get him in the third round, who cares? Yeah. Uh, because it, you're going to spend you know minimal draft capital to get him. But if he works out, oh, what a home run you hit by getting him. So I think somebody will trade up for him in the third. They're not going to let him drop out of the third. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, and so. I could see him drop to the fourth just solely because it becomes a new day. And yeah. in the hustle and bustle of everything, I could believe that, you know, he just kind of falls down boards. And then when you sit back and you look at who's left on your who's left and you see that he's still there and you go, well, you know, we kind of dropped him off our board because we thought someone else was going to take him, but no one took him. See. So I yeah. could see it happening. It depends on how many teams there are uh, that go for it. But I could see it just if if, you know, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle somewhere that he slips. But he, I, that's what I think. I think if it was. If it goes to the fourth round, that day three, uh, I think it would be basically between day one, between day two and day three, people realize that he slipped. And if they had taken him off the board, he suddenly gets back put back on the board. Yeah. No, I, like I said, I, I can't see it. I think a team will trade for him, but we'll see. And here's also something, like I said, these reports come out somewhat salacious, but I try to get them from the, as credible sources as possible and at least provide the sources to you guys. Uh, Dane Brugler said on the athletic football show when he was talking about draft prospects, he claims, and I got it from Marcus Mosher. Um, but he's his tweet is that one quick note from Dane Brugler on the athletic football show Texas D tackle to Andre Sweat was pushing 390 pounds during the college football playoffs. Yeah, I saw that. So that also, I think that report 
probably combined with the fact. So if he if he was pushing, let's just say this, let's just say he was exaggerating, and it's he's pushing three hundred and eighty pounds. Yeah, because three three ninety seems. I, I got to go back and now look at him and see how big he looked. But then, and if that's the case, damn, he's he's moving really good. Like yeah. he's, he's moving amazingly well for a guy that was pushing three ninety. Um, but let's just say he was pushing three eighty. Let's say let's say he was at three eighty, not pushing three ninety. Um, and he arrived at the combine at 366. I was at the pro day at 367. So hell, still he would have. So remember, I said maybe, maybe he should have lost like third, like 12 to 15 pounds. Then I guess he would have actually if he was pushing that kind of weight before yeah. he got to the combine. And th- in that case, he was moving. In that case, you'll get him as the, the lightest he's ever been. <laughs> like you basically get you you get you the lightest to much race sweats ever been. If that's what he was pushing. So like I said, some of these reports. I, I don't. You know, I think they may be designed just to drive down draft stock at this point, so you can get these guys at a bargain basement value. But like I said, that's the note that's out there, and I think that this is the reason why you're starting to see. In addition to the DWI thing, is it ain't only the DWI thing. There are red flags. I think that teams had on the evaluation of Tom J. Sweat before that. Remember the uh, Dane Brugler report saying that teams thought he had a he had a reputation for partying and having a good time, and he uh, he assured them that he had moved on from that phase of his life and then now he would become more of a, a professional and that he was prioritizing football. And I guess that obviously the DWI charge did not reflect well on him trying to uh, reassure uh, coaches and scouts that he was not a guy that loves to party and would prioritize football. So I think in addition to that, but now you got the reports about the weight and remember that was also a red flag prior to the combine and prior to everything was, oh man, what about his weight? So everything that was a red flag for him seems to now be reaffirmed in some way. And I think that's what's ultimately yeah. just tanking the draft stuff, tanking it. Yeah, tanking unfortunately. It. But yeah, that's it at least, and it's at least tanking it for some teams. And there may be somebody who's trying to wait and pounce. There, there I'm oh, sure yeah, there's a couple teams that is. are waiting to pounce. Uh, but the Cowboys, honestly, the Cowboys should be in that conversation. They should. Jerry Jones loves giving people second chances. Exactly. He loves a he loves a troubled yet talented soul. That's him. He's a I would call I call he's the Saint Jude of the NFL. He, he <laughs> loves the Patriot Saint of se- second chances. He, they would that would fit the Cowboys, man. If you get him in the third round, that'd be perfect. Yeah. Because the world in the street is. I heard uh, Brian Broder say this. They're going to put weight back on Mozzie. Remember, Dan Quinn wanted Mozzie to lose weight. Yeah. He brought him as a nose tackle. And they apparently Zim, Zimmer wants him to gain weight uh, as a D tackle. So that's out there. All right, let's talk about A.D. Mitchell. The same thing's happening to A.D. Mitchell. And uh, this comes from Bob McGinn. He claims a scout um, informed him of this. And obviously this scout is anonymous. Um, he said, and this is the excerpt I'm reading here. They're talking about A.D. Mitchell. He's got Garrett Wilson S catch radius, athletic ability, body control, but he's almost uncoachable. Before you even get to the diabetic part, he's kind of going to do it his way. He's a little bit of a wild horse. You've got to see if you can harness him in. Then once you do that, he doesn't address the diabetic stuff in a mature way. He's very much a boom or bust type guy. He's been diagnosed as a type one diabetic. You're going to have to assign someone to be next to him for his first few years because his issues are all about his diabetes and his blood sugar, said a second scout. When his blood sugar's off, he's rude. He's abrasive. He doesn't pay attention in meetings. It's why you get really, really blank character is she you know it you know i mean they were they they use a certain word i can't use it uh character reports coming out of georgia um and texas but when his stuff is normal and they get him normal by lunchtime he's out at practice high energy best practice player loves football Um, a third scout said diabetes was a major concern you've got to look out for it and he's got to take care of himself he said every diabetic does there's some questions but at the end of the day he's a good player that hasn't done anything overly malicious he's probably just immature and i always say that the, the silly season basically the scouting season you know in the off season prior to the nfl draft it's all about reasons not to find any reasons not to draft the guy yeah. it's easy to find any you know any jabroni watching a player can tell you what he's good at and why you would draft that player. A scout shop is actually to tell you what a player is bad at, what cannot be coached out of their skill set, what the liabilities are in their skill set. It did essentially scouts are critics, right? What does a critic do? They critique. 
Yeah. They criticize. <laughs> All right. Very rarely does a critic give a glowing, uh, very optimistic, complimentary critique. Right. Because they are that when they do, it's a big deal because they're critics. And that's what scouts are. Scouts are just critics. And that's why this is basically a season where they're very critical of the players. And I have never the, the diabetes issue didn't even come up at Texas. No, we covered Texas. It didn't even come up. And now it's a big issue, apparently, with the scouts. Yeah, it, this would not surprise me at all. If a lot of this came from Georgia. Could be where it's Georgia people that he transferred out. Don't draft him. Draft our guys. Lad McConkey. That's a that's a class act. Lad McConkey. But that, <laughs> but Andy Mitchell. Your voice change. Yeah, see, it's a class act. <laughs> Lad McConkey. <laughs> that, that George I accent. Some that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was some of that dad or something. You're like what? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> he's a good lad huh mm. oh man that's great uh, but no you can you're probably right about that you're probably right about that actually um actually you probably are right about and that. and because we didn't hear that texas i know and it may have been an issue that it was an issue probably as early in his career and then as he get as he gets older and as he matures more and as he you know figures out more of how to deal with you know his diabetes or whatever else he's dealing with then you know he deals with it better but if you say well when he was a freshman he came in and and he didn't know how to deal with it and he was a real problem as a freshman well what was he as a as a junior oh great guy model, but no but he was real immature player, as a teammate. freshman well wasn't yeah. that a couple of years ago yeah but he's gonna do it again i don't know if he will or not but yeah and i saw i saw that that report and then i saw a bunch of longhorn players basically disputed yeah. basically saying like this is completely insane what this is this saying is nonsense <laughs> yeah so I, yeah. I could believe it was something that it maybe wasn't addressed properly in georgia and he didn't, you know, he wasn't, you know, they dealt with it and maybe not in the best way or, hey, you need to handle this. And at Texas, they did go, we have a nutritionist. We'll help you get on the right track and then you yeah. can figure it out from there. But we'll help you get the right track on it. And, yeah. may, and I, that's me being a homer and <laughs> believing. In no, Texas. no, I think you're right. Because like, so we, I, we, we did that. not hear one thing about that all season. We heard he was not an enthusiastic blocker. We heard he gave up on routes. We saw we that. Heard, we saw we that. heard all those things. <laughs> but that we never heard that he was a problem in in meetings or not paying attention the uncoachable thing none of those were a part of anything we heard at texas yeah i'm with you and like i said we saw that so we saw that he was not an enthusiastic blocker got better as the season went on uh we saw the, that you know some routes that if he wasn't he was upset when the ball wasn't going to him and when the ball wasn't going to him at times you didn't see him give 130 yeah. percent on those routes and those are things that you could watch on film and see but yeah those reports i we cover Texas, and there are a lot of great uh, reporters and a lot of great platforms and websites that cover Texas football. And I don't think any of them reported anything about him being a problem uh, in the locker room or no. a bad teammate or anything. No, or like yeah, in the morning he was a bad guy, but by yeah, lunch he, he was okay. Blood sugar was low, and he just in a cranky mood. And it's like, yeah. I didn't hear any of that. No, but that's, you're right. And, and that's it is exactly too. It's, Georgia, you yeah. know, like that's another thing. Scouts, a lot of what scouts do too, is it's about forming relationships with certain people. And then those people will tell you the inside dirt of, you know, Hey, is this guy any good? And then that guy will tell you, well, you know, he's pretty good by noon. He's usually pretty good after he has lunch, but in the morning he can be a little difficult. And if someone from Georgia says that it could get spun into, well, he's uncoachable in the morning. He doesn't put an effort out uh, because it is these, I mean, you know, I'd see it enough at, at basketball games. You'd see it, and you've seen it, you know, with, with football as well, that, you know, you're just trying to – you try and talk to coaches. You try and talk to uh, assistants and, and people that are around the program that deal with these players and just get any sort of character reports out of them is what these scouts are doing. So if you get – if you have a couple people at Georgia that said, yeah, he could sometimes be a problem in the morning, that can spin into, well, he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's immature, and – and since we've never heard any of that at Texas, either John Bianco's doing a great job, which we always know he is, but he's doing a great job, or or that that was more of a Georgia thing and not a Texas thing. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, uh, getting to this um, this Daniel Jeremiah report, uh, we talk about you know, talk that is dropping draft stock of players. Um, Daniel Jeremiah claims that Byron Murphy is a potential riser. Um, he said a potentially a riser into the top ten. He said there are always late draft risers and prospects who go higher than expected. Dan Jeremiah was asked about a few of his favorites, and one name stuck out above the rest, Texas D-tackle Byron Murphy. 
Um, he said one big reason, especially in the post Aaron Donald NFL, is that top tier D tackles are in such short supply. It's a league that is placed in ever more premium on defensive tackles. I've been telling you guys that. He said, I was talking to a general manager, and when you look around the league and we ask who are the true impact dominant defensive tackles, there are maybe seven or eight of them, edge rushers. It goes a lot deeper than that. Um, so he said Murphy's talent as a Donald-esque interior rusher, along with the dearth of deep tackle talent, could combine to create a perfect storm that pushes round that pushes Murphy up in round one, perhaps even in the top ten. It says here, and Darren Jeremiah says um, when he was asked about the players that he would buy stock in, he said two stocks I'd like to buy a little week over a little over a week away from the draft: Graham Barton and Byron Murphy. So their draft stock increasing for Byron Murphy, yeah. potentially, if you ask uh, Daniel Jeremiah there. Um, all right. Uh, instead, I want to get to uh, Roger Rant. We'll push that to uh, next segment. We'll get into Roger Rant coming up next segment. Uh, before uh, we do that, I just real quick, I want to go over this. Bucky Brooks, the top positions. He got the top <clears throat> five players at every position. Uh, the Longhorns that he's got in his top five players at every position. He still got Jonathan Brooks as the number one running back on his board. Um, he still got uh, and, and look at wide receivers. None of the Longhorns made into his top five wide receivers. A little strange. I don't. I mean, he's got Marvin Harrison, Romo Dunze, Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas Jr., and Kian Coleman. And even basically as an honorable mention, fr- shout out to Troy Franklin. So he doesn't love the. Texas wide receivers as much um, as a lot of other folks do. Um, tight ends, he's got JT Sanders as his second tight end behind Brock Bowers, um, which I think has been pretty consistent. Uh, if you look at interior defensive lineman, which we just talked about, uh, he's got Byron Murphy as his top interior defensive lineman. So uh, he's got eh, three Longhorns in that, in terms of the top five at their position as well. Um, so Bucky Brooks showing some love to Texas. All right, we come back, we'll get into that uh, college football top 100 list um, but also i'll tell you what you can expect to see conceptually schematically in the spring game the staples the go-to uh concepts for sark um, as an offensive mind um what are those we'll identify those and talk about that a little bit coming up next in rod's rant of the day right here on uh the rodcast featuring patrick davis i'm like tom longhorn rod Babers coming back on the horn
All right, welcome back to the Rodcast. Time to uh, get into Rod's Rant of the Day. First is uh, CBS uh, Sports Top 100 list. Um, they ranked the top 100 players in all of college football. I want to get to this uh, yesterday, but we ran out of time. Uh, they have five Longhorns in this uh, top 100 list. Uh, Patrick, you wanted to guess the Longhorns that are on this top 100 list for the Longhorns, the five that, are on, that made the list? I, I know there's three that are pretty high on it got to be you know once i mean a few of these are easy two at least two of them are really easy yeah we know quinn right. ewers is on this list quinn ewers is according to him 15th 15th best 15th on this list uh we know kelvin banks is going to be on that list he is 10th 10th on he that list 10th best player in college football according to uh list. let's say isaiah bond he is 14th yes on the list they got him as the 14th best player in college football uh let's see where we want to go? Do we want to say Anthony Hill? Did he make it? Did he crack the list this year? Did Anthony Hill did not crack this list that I saw. I mean, I okay. went through it. He did not crack it. Um, yeah, I, that, uh, that's it. Those three are pretty obvious, but the other two are not as obvious. I'll admit that they are not as obvious. Yeah, I mean, that's I, I'm starting to go yeah. down because now it's a list of Ooh. a bunch of guys I could name that are all kind of in that yeah, second. I don't know who would be the they're, who could, they're saying go, would be the breakup. Maybe Makuba. I guess it's back. Boom. You could go with Kuba. They, been, they went it, it's CJ Baxter. Okay. It's 76 and a Trey Moore at 85. Okay. I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. But I, I mean, I think CJ Baxter, we just saw him last year. And so we saw, we were looking at it as we know that he got the job taken over from Jonathan Brooks, that he, yeah. Jonathan Brooks took his job, but that was also as a freshman. If you know, he looks like he's put on some weight, which is, one of the main factors he really needed to do. We know his explosiveness. We know he won the job as a freshman. So it's he not hard to believe that if he won yeah. the job as a freshman, that he's going to be really, really good as a sophomore. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that. And I uh, went through, and like I said, I, <clears throat> I went through the entire list. The only schools that I counted, that I thought had more players than Texas were Georgia, Bama and Ohio state. Um, Michigan was Michigan was close. Michigan was also in that category too. I think Michigan was was really close too. But I believe you're looking at it, it was like Michigan, Ohio State, Georgia, and Bama were the only schools that had more or as many as Texas had on this specific list. Like I said, like yeah, I said, and, I mean, and three in the top fifteen. Yeah, exactly. And I've actually I got to go back and look and see if anybody has that many in the top. 15. I, I know, I know, Colorado point. had two in the top fifteen. Yeah, because they had Shadur and Travis Hunter up there, man. But they're dealing with like another exodus of talent. Probably a lot of guys were leaving Colorado. I thought they were past the point where they had a lot of guys leaving Colorado. But uh, Dion doesn't seem concerned. Dion seems seems be calm and cool about it. And Dion can recruit, so he's bringing in guys. But it's just weird that a lot of guys, a lot of really good players that he just brought in, are leaving Colorado for whatever reason. Anyway, uh, but there you go. That is the college, uh, the CBS college football top 100 list. Yeah. And uh, five Longhorns listed. And that's like I said, you today, Baron probably could have been, yeah. you know, considered Makuba, as you brought up, could have been Anthony Hill could have been considered. I mean, there's a few other guys that probably could have been considered to be on, on that list, probably the bottom of it. Uh, but yeah, CJ Baxter, Trey Moore, people are high on Trey Moore. Remember ESPN, when they, uh, they listed their top pass rushers, uh, they put Trey Moore in there. Yeah, they no, I, I mean, I top think 10. Trey like, Moore he's is getting a lot of national love, but he's got the stats to back it up. Yeah, he he's definitely somebody that it, it, I should have named him off because if you saw he was in the transfer portal, one of those guys that you really wanted to get because of what he could do. And, I, you know, the only issue with him is that he doesn't necessarily have the body type that you would normally put as a star to edge. Yeah, but he's moving out. Yeah, but but at the, what his 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 you know, his stats so far and his track record so far would tell you that he is a really, really good edge. And hopefully he he outplays even that at Texas, because if he comes in with that dog in him, that's still, you know, that's at practice and getting beat around a little bit. And, you know, every day he's got to walk in as the smaller guy in the in the edge room that that'll get him fired up to go in there and and try and prove some more people wrong as he uh, goes throughout this year. No, I, t- I totally agree with you. And it's, it's interesting you said that about the body because it, it, it's even more glaring how he's not undersized. He's just not – he didn't have the wingspan, the length, and the yeah. frames of the other guys like Ethan Burke and Colton Vossett. And, hell, look what Baron Sorrell's done with his body 
Um, and then Colin Simmons coming in, it's just long rangey and freakish uh, with, you know, NFL upside. So the, he doesn't fit that, but his BGO, he's probably got the best BGO out of all yeah. those guys. That's ball get off. And the BGO will be different. It's one thing that you'll be able to see in just watching the spring game, the edges, the, those guys are going to be, they, those guys are going to get off the football at the snap, like nobody's business, like they haven't done in Sark's tenure here. Cause he's got those types of athletes now on the edge. And I think Baron Terrell and Ethan Burke will be better at it too, but he's the best natural pass rusher on the roster right now is Trey Moore. And that's why people yeah. are high on him because if you're in a pass rushing situation and he's, he is more of an outside linebacker, hybrid edge rusher to me, I think in the NFL, he'll just be kind of like a hybrid potentially player. That's why you even, there's been talk. I believe Anthony Hill's the one that said it, that he's been, um, you know, that he's been dropping back in coverage at times too. So I think in, in PK system, they understand uh, we got to showcase that a little bit too. We can't just have um you know, r- rushing up field on every down. Uh, there are going to be downs where we got them dropping back in coverage just because teams are going to try to put them in that situation. Um, so, or as a change of pace, a, a counter of some sort. Um, all right, there you go. Some uh, some interesting conversation about the best players in college football, Texas. Three of them in the top 15, as my man Patrick said. All right, so what do you expect to see? Here we go in the spring game. If you're, if I am coaching against Sark and defending his offense, I got a game plan against his offense. There are certain conceptual schematic um, plays and uh, just kind of um, really foundational uh, uh, concepts and plays for Sark that are really mainstays and go-tos for him as an offensive coordinator. And you, you see them over and over again, um, and you see them game after game because those are the most popular concepts for Sark. They are the tent poles of, of his offensive philosophy. And running the ball, that is the wide zone, um, the inside zone, and the split wide zone, the split inside zone. Those are the key running plays. He loves to throw in some counter tray in there. And then off of those five basic run concepts, which that is the bulk of their running game, they'll close out games by running duo, which is essentially a double team block at the point of attack. Um, They'll close out games running duo, which uh, Jay Wood says their favorite play. And they'll run it from that, that try that I I call it a trident, but it's a, it's a tripod bunch uh, where they have usually that, uh, tight end at the tip of the spear, if you will, there, the tip of that bunch of that tip of the triangle, and they'll just pound teams in submission, running duo over and over again uh, with, with combo blocks, duo blocks there at the point of attack. And so those are kind of the six ones, but you won't see, I don't think, a lot of that in the spring game because they're not closing out the opponent. I think they'll run their bases, which are wide zone, uh, inside zone, split wide zone, and split inside zone. And yeah, you'll see that counter trade. Now, off of those run concepts, Sark says his, his offense is a RPO based passing game. So he's got RPO concepts off of all of those run plays. There's a uh, a, a counter, a GY counter, counter trade RPO. There's an inside zone bubble RPO where they run the bubble screen on the outside um, combined with the inside zone as the running element, but tag it with the bubble screen on the outside. There's the um, the wide zone bubble RPO wide zone but then same thing tagging with a bubble screen on the outside you go and see that because that those are staples in sark's offense um the inside zone glance kind of the goat they call it a ghost glance which is essentially a skinny post from the slot or a slot glance uh, combined with the inside zone rpo definitely will see that because those are just the natural tags from their favorite run plays a tag is a a route that you add to it in the rpo concept um but then you'll see the I, I, you'll probably see that slide wheel route glance rpo which is uh the number one receiver running the post route number two runs that uh that wheel concept and the running back runs a flare route out of the backfield you probably can see it if you've watched enough Texas football over and over again probably going to see that they'll run mesh because Sark loves mesh on third down he loves the mesh concept essentially a pick or rub concept uh for the uh the wide receivers trying to pick or rub uh the dbs get them caught up get them lost in traffic bumped off in traffic you're definitely going to see the mesh concepts um and, and i don't know if arch will throw they're gonna they're gonna throw the deep ball Sark wants to, to implement the deep ball more so he's gonna throw the deep ball 
Um, I I think e- each quarterback will get like three or four shots. I think you'll get to nine, maybe even ten total deep balls thrown in the game, depending on the weather. If the weather cooperates, maybe it won't. Um, but if it does cooperate and they got some some uh, favorable weather, you'll see what um, Sark calls – well, not Sark calls it. All coaches call it. It's a dagger concept. That's a vertical route by the number two receiver, um, a dig by the number one, which is a six route, which is a fifth. 12 to 15 yards and an in cut. And then you'll get a, a drag route coming from that backside. Sometimes it's an over, which is a deep drag route, um, kind of a deep drag route or a, a shallow drag route. You'll get an over and under on the backside with that concept. So you'll get that because Sark loves that concept. You get it time and time and time again. Um, and I also, what he started using a lot of last year, was the the deep curl route. As a matter of fact, if you go look at explosive play rate, um, you, you're probably it's a max it's a max protect um, deep curl route, and he would run it a lot with Quinn Ewers. I don't know if he'll run it with Arch because I, mean, I I think Arch can do it, but I don't know if Arch can make that throw. It's essentially it's an 18 yard curl route down the field. Quinn's great at throwing it because Quinn's got a cannon of an arm. Malik was can even throw it because Malik had a cannon of an arm. I know Arch has got a strong arm, but I don't know if it's that strong. That is truly an NFL throw. Um, it's just deep curl routes. Like I said, 18 yards down the field, max protection, two receiver routes. Uh, but so you got a 40% explosive play rate out of that 67% success rate uh, on that concept, 72%, 72% success rate on first down because – it's not a route that DBs are instructed to have to cover in college because most quarterbacks can't make that throw. Um, once I start to cancel routes on the route tree as a defensive back, as you get deeper into your route progression, um, as you get deep into your stem, I'm canceling out the, the – he's not going to run a slant. If you're at seven yards, you're not going to run a slant. You'll run a skinny post. You may run the post route, but you're not going to run a slant. You're not going to run the quick out. So you can almost start to cancel out routes as the receiver works their way down the field. And by the time the receiver gets to 15 yards, I'm thinking to myself, well, he's running deep. I might as well turn my hips and run because no matter what they're throwing, post route, post corner route, nine route, it's going to be a deep route. I got to run. It's going to be a track meet. I got to stay on that upfield shoulder. But then this dude sits it down at 18, 19 yards. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell? As a DB, Patrick, I'm already running. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, thinking yeah. about the deep ball. And then this dude sits it down at 18, 19 yards and runs a curl route in college. That's why that route is concept is so effective. So I don't, I don't know if you're going to see it necessarily, but it's, it just, it is a mind blank to a, to a young DB in college. Cause you don't defend every route. Cause every quarterback can't throw every route. You don't want to be defending ghosts. That's stupid. Right. But with Quinn, sometimes you have to, cause he can actually make those. Throws. He can make an out, a throw of an out route from the, from the far hash to the far sideline. He can, we seen him do it versus Bama in 2020, uh, 2022. If he can do it versus Bama, he can do it versus anybody. Yeah, Those are routes I'm not supposed to have to cover in college because most quarterbacks can't make that throw. That dude can't. Anyway, but so that's not good. But you, you also see a flood concept. Flood is when you, you have all three of your receivers in one region or area of the field. You flood a zone. You flood an area of the field. He loves the flood concept. So you'll see the play action flood concepts too. So there are a few of the – concepts, a few of the plays, Sark's faves um, that you'll see in um, the, the spring game. I can guarantee you that. All right, we come back. We got what the facts, what the facts, what the stats. We'll throw some of those out there. Some are sports r- related. Some are outside the sports realm, but all of them intriguing nonetheless. We'll get to that when we come back. This is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis of Lifetime Long Run. Rod Davis coming back on the horn.
Hey, what's up, folks? I'm Tom Longhorn, Rod Babers here. If time is money, my friends at Apple Leasing are in the business of saving you both. Apple Leasing has the ability to put you in any make or model vehicle that you want. The pros at Apple Leasing can help you get the price you want, the payment you want, on the car that you want. And all it takes is one phone call or one click on Apple Leasing's website, and you'll get a quote on any make or model vehicle that you want. They can even give you an estimate of the value of your trade-in right over the phone. Apple Leasing Simple Interest Easy Lease allows you to have a lot more flexibility, which is going to give you more possibilities and options to help you find the vehicle that fits you best, but more importantly, the vehicle that fits your budget best. Everything seems overpriced these days. That's why leasing makes more sense than ever. You're only paying for the part of the car you're actually using. So call Apple Leasing today, 512-346-9977, and let them see how much money they can save you. They get all the same discounts, all the same incentives that the dealers do, except my friends at Apple Leasing, they prefer to pass those savings on to you, the customer. So give them a call, 512-346-9977. That's 512 512- Four six nine nine seven seven, or visit AppleLeasing.com. That's AppleLeasing.com. All right, um, a couple of facts here. I don't know what the Cowboys need to do something about this Dak Prescott thing. Dak, Dak Prescott's salary counts for more than a fifth of the Cowboys' total cap space this year. <laughs> 
That's crazy. That's insane. They need to they need to resign Dak and extend Dak so they can bring that number down. I'm sorry, that actually wasn't a part of what the facts. I just saw that number from uh, Warren Sharp, <laughs> and it, I was taken aback. So I apologize, mm. guys. Uh, okay, uh, let's get to what the facts, what the stats here. I got a couple of them to share with you guys. Uh, a couple of them are from the sports world, but some beyond the sports world that I think are pretty interesting. Okay, so have you heard that the – that back in 2010, Patrick, and this is NBA related, so I'm sure this is, may have crossed your timeline. In 2010, the Knicks were attempting to woo and court LeBron James, right? They were yes. trying to recruit him to New York City. So they put together a celebrity video to help recruit him to New York City. And it had, apparently it, was something that had been under wraps and had not seen the light of day. Um, And apparently now it is, it's been leaked and it is on the internet. Now this is a video from 2010 featuring the city's A-list celebrities, including President Trump, Ruli Giuliani, Harvey Weinstein is on this thing. (laughs) <laughs> making the cameo on it no apparently that's and I, I guess this is one of the reasons it has not uh seen the light of day but now apparently it's been leaked i am looking for it i will find it. if i find it i will send it to you but um yeah i think i, I had some paywalls that wanted to try to find it for, i bet cb probably has seen it and probably will send it to us anyway but um, i'm gonna find it but it's out there it's out there this, is this and, who, is this who james and, dolan is hanging out with yeah <laughs> No, I mean, but it's, I haven't seen this, and I, I haven't even heard of it. This is my first time even hearing about it. Apparently, uh, Tony Soprano was on it, too. There you go. So That, that was good. <laughs> not, not the actor. The actual Tony Soprano. They were like, oh, no, like, yeah. Like, we want to keep this sorry. with sleazy people. So we didn't want to bring in a nice actor. I do. I think he may have played the character on it instead of playing himself. <laughs> uh, no, I'm serious. Like, I, I, I haven't seen this, but it was oh, a recruitment Lord. video. Yeah, God, uh, geez. it's going to be great when we find it. So, yeah, I don't know, but uh, that's just the report. I got it from Front Office Sports, so I think it's pretty legit. I mean, Front Office Sports, oh, uh, they this got a is, good reputation. This is from James Dolan, the owner who uh, oh, who dude. installed facial recognition technology at Madison Square Garden and used it to <laughs> enforce his ban list. And apparently... Oh, former players and stuff? We know, but like for fans who talk bad about him on the internet, he'll take wow. their profile picture and put it into a database. Wow. And then when it scans him in, he'll, there apparently this is what the report was. There was levels of it uh, from, from like you give them a warning when they walk in to you or they're not allowed in, but there's all these different levels of like how you much you harass them throughout basically their experience there. That is crazy. Because, That's- and it's not necessarily they talk bad about the Knicks. It's bad. They talk bad about James Dolan. That's some J. Edgar Hoover type So stuff, stuff like where people would just post like James Dolan, sell the team. You're the worst owner in sports. And then he'd take their profile picture and he put it in the facial recognition. He power just to be that petty. Yeah. To, he has a billionaire. That was a report. the reports. This was, this was a year uh, or two ago that those okay. reports came out that he was using that to try yeah, and be- because there were certain people that were like, I would walk in and they, they, someone would come over and beeline to me and be like, okay, well, Bob, hey, you, you said this on the internet and you can't. You can't be you saying like, these in like what? You, like I, my Twitter has an egg as an avatar. What are you talking about? Like, I, mean, I got like three like, followers. Here, right? Nobody like, cares dude, about what I talk about. You yeah, just got uh, you got lucky wow. that James that Jalen Brunson is saving your city right now, but yeah, uh, I mean, I think LeBron dodged one too. LeBron probably knew all about that kind of stuff too, which is yeah. part of the reason LeBron chose not to go to the New York Knicks. Yeah. But yeah, and where do you end up with more celebrities in L.A.? He did, he did, but at least, at least, not as crazy eccentric ownership as the Knicks no, have right now. No, uh, and did, James Dolan, I believe, is the one who's the owner of the that uh, the the Vegas Sphere. Is he not? Uh, he's Maybe one of the owners. Yeah, he's one, one of the, the owners. He's of one that, of the, yeah. the investors. Yeah, but he because he owns there, yeah. Madison Square Garden, he owns like all yeah. that. So, so. I think it's yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, all right. So what the facts? Another factoid here in the history of the NFL draft, the latest that we've seen a running back draft. Remember, is number fifty four. Uh, that was Bishop Sankey in 2014 um, at pick 54. He was the uh, first running back draft. That was the latest that the first running back in the draft has been drafted uh, in the history of the NFL draft. There's some people that believe this year you could also v- come very close to Jonathan Brooks being drafted 
you know, late in the draft. I don't know if they'll wait till 54 to draft the first running back in this draft, but it's not considered a deep running back draft. And the top running back on the board, Jonathan Brooks, has been dealing with uh, an injury. And Cowboys are 56? And they're 56. So he's definitely – he won't make it past 56, but if he's drafted at 56 and that's the first running back off the board, it'll be a new record for the latest of the first running back has been drafted. So you don't want to be a quarterback in a year that ends in – or running back in the year that ends in four. You're going in the draft. The year that ends in four is the bad. <laughs> uh, that's a great point. Yeah, 2014, 2024. I hadn't thought about that. No, no. We'll see who's in 2004. I'll have to look that up and see if there's. <laughs> that's a good point. I like that. Um, okay, so uh, that's enough facts for today. We're good. Uh, I was going to get to some more facts, but that might lead us down a rabbit hole, and then we'll be five more minutes over than we need to be. Uh, so we'll save those for another time because they're a little evergreen. All right, we come back. We'll get into the NBA play-in. We'll preview the play-in games for tonight. The last of the play ins, and then of course, the actual NBA playoffs will start this weekend. We'll talk about the most intriguing matchups, which might be the one closest to home the Dallas Mavs versus the LA Clippers. We'll preview that one a little bit, talk about the LA Lakers and the Denver Nuggets a little bit, um, and talk about the NBA playoffs overall. All of that and more when we return. This is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Mohan Rod Davis coming back on the horn.
Welcome back to the broadcast. It is a freak flag, feel good, fake it till you make it. Ric Flair, woo, football, 512 Friday edition of the show. And 512 Friday means that my man Patrick, the idea, you know, plays jams from local bands and artists, very talented human beings that you have a chance to catch live right here in the ATX. Who are we jamming right now, Patrick? This is Tamika Jones, and she is playing Saturday at the Courtyard ATX. Nice. I like that. Uh, there you go. My man Patrick always hooking you up. Are, are you, are, do you have a guess where the Courtyard ATX is? Uh, I do not have a guess. I'm not cool enough. It, it, it's I, I feel like this is a place venue. you would know. It's a new venue that's in the place of an old venue. The Courtyard ATX. No. It, not, is, uh, it is where Cedar Street Courtyard used to be. Okay. Yeah, so they're down I, there on 4th okay. Street where yeah. it's an open space and the Cedar Street Courtyard, that's uh that that's now where that is so they have now upgraded i guess and done and put some oh, stuff cool. in there so cedar street courtyard is now the courtyard atx i had to look mm. that up i saw it and i was like i don't know this venue and they're saying it's downtown no. and then you say no okay it's where cedar yeah, street yeah no honestly man there's so so many parts of austin now literally if you don't if i don't go there for a a, a, a few months it is it don't even look the same no, like especially parts of downtown where they got construction. You go there, like, hold up, this don't look the same at all. This is a parking um, lot, and now <laughs> it's a building. <laughs> yeah, so now it's a high rise condo. I used, to, I used to park here, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh yeah, no parking in the city. We know that, but yeah, it's just yeah, it's just a city that's growing really, really fast. Um, so, uh, but my man Patrick always keeping you in the know of where you need to go to go see some of these very, very talented folks out there. Uh, he also keeps us in the know when it comes to the headlines for the horn headlines. Or so we'll get that coming up here momentarily. Uh, he keeps us updated, educated, and informed on the big headlines of the day. We will address uh, the Longhorn uh, uh, transfer portal acquisitions and departures, but some of the also possible targets for Texas in the transfer portal. Uh, there are reports, shout out to my man Bobby Burton over at On Texas Football. There are reports that Texas could be really aggressive in the transfer portal at the D-tackle position um, and that they are eyeing several D-tackles that are in the in the transfer portal or expected to hit the transfer portal to help bring in reinforcements to fill that whole potential hole on their roster. Um, yeah, that would say a lot about the the lack of uh, confidence or trust that the, the the coaches have in the interior D linemen they have on campus right now, um, but I, I don't think Sark wants to take any chances. Um, so a lot of talk about Texas bringing in. My man Bobby Bird said they could they could bring in two D tackles in this transfer portal window. Remember they already brought in Savea. They could bring in two, and Johnny Nansen might be the man to save the day. We'll explain that too coming up as well. But first, we're going to get into uh, previewing the play-in games tonight, and also previewing a few of the playoff matchups coming up this weekend because the NBA playoffs officially start this weekend. Next segment, we'll go behind the burnt orange curtain. We're talking spring practice. Uh, we'll also hear from one of the Texas players, Manny Muhammad. Uh, you had Baron Sorrell, Alfred Collins, and Manny Muhammad have player availabilities yesterday and spoke to the media we got some sound of manny muhammad um and, it, and and i think in this audio you'll see why i like manny muhammad so much and why people are so high on him overall as a player uh we'll get into that too coming up uh we go behind the burn on curve but first let's let my man patrick uh hit us up with the horn headlines get us updated educated and informed about the big headlines of the day if you will all right, your Horn Headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Texas baseball will look to get their season back on the right track in their weekend series with TCU starting tonight. The Longhorns are 1-4 and four in series openers in Big 12 play this season, not winning an opening game since Texas Tech March 8th. The Texas pitching will hope to get a break against a team that has not scored more than four runs in a game since March. Texas softball will take their record of six straight wins against ranked teams to Kansas this weekend to take on the Jayhawks. Sophomore catcher Reese Atwood will look to make history as she is only six RBIs away from setting the single-season RBI record at Texas. In the NBA, the final playing games will be settled tonight with the Bulls taking on the Heat and the Kings facing the Pelicans. Both Jimmy Butler and Zion Williamson will miss their respective games due to injuries suffered in the seven-versus-eight matchups. Despite the injuries, the Heat are still favored to beat the Bulls. However, Sacramento gets the slight edge against New Orleans. In Major League Baseball, the Rangers withstood a tough first outing for rookie Jack Leiter, who gave up seven earned runs in three and two-thirds innings, but they won the game 9-7 to seven and won the series against the Tigers. In action starting today, the Astros will start a series with the Nationals, with Justin Verlander returning from injury, and the Rangers will begin their series with the Braves, 
with pregame starting at 545 right here on the horn. And that is your horn headlines. All right, thank you very much for the Horn headlines there, Patrick. Let's jump right into the play-in matchups before we start previewing <clears throat> some of these uh, NBA playoff matchups officially. Uh, on the eastern side of things, the play-in uh, game will feature Chicago at Miami. Uh, the disappointing uh, news is that Jimmy Butler, Hemi, will not be available. He's got an MCL injury that's going to keep him out uh, for that matchup. <clears throat> the regular season series between these two tied at 2-2, uh, so Miami with no Jimmy Butler. Uh, also, Alex Caruso is going to be out. He's dealing with a foot injury. So both of these teams have de- have dealing with have dealt with a lot of injuries. As a matter of fact, uh, I went over the games lost due to injuries and suspensions and personal reasons and load management uh, for every team earlier in the show. Uh, both these teams are top 10. I believe uh, Miami is at six. I think Chicago is ninth in terms of games lost through the injury. Uh, and once again, that's affecting them in the playoffs. Uh, but Kobe White, I think, is going to be the story, Patrick. He had 42 points, a career high versus Atlanta in that first play-in matchup. Uh, no, how about that? Nine um, nine rebounds, six assists, and zero turnovers in that 42-point performance. That's probably the most uh, impressive number of all is that zero turnovers. Um, if he shows up uh, and they still got, you know, uh, De- DeMar, DeMar DeRozan, um, who's a good player for them, too. It seems like Chicago has a a big advantage here versus Miami. Now, Miami will be at home and uh, Miami does play a really unique style that gives a lot of teams trouble. Um, but, man, without Jimmy Butler, I just uh, I find a hard time. I find it hard to see Miami actually find a way to pull out this win against Chicago, but both these teams dealing with injuries um, couldn't go either way. You said that Miami still favored. Miami is still you. favored by a point and a half in this game. That's that, crazy. That may be home court somewhat too. They are, they are yeah. the home court favorites. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, the way Kobe white's playing, you know, especially if, you know, depending on if Kyle Lowry's trying to guard Kobe white, he sh- could still have a pretty good game. He's going to body him a lot more than he was bodied in the last game. Uh, but Kobe White still have a good game. I think DeMar DeRozan, this is the type of game he can shine in as well because he has that mid-range game. He just knows how to be a veteran and move around against a team like the Heat that can give some young guys a lot of problems with the way they play and the physicality they play with. Uh, but I, I, I think the Bulls, just because it's just when you look at this Heat roster and you take Jimmy Butler off it, they're they're pretty bare bones with Jimmy Butler on the team. Uh, Tyler Hero shot nine for 27 in the game uh in in the game on Wednesday and I like Tyler Hero is not as bad as some people make him out to be but you know he has to shoot immensely better in this game for Miami to have any shot in it uh I I'll, I'll take Miami I'll take DeMar DeRozan and and that team to to be able to pull out a victory here and make the playoffs now that that may be the last victory they have but <laughs> I'll give them that uh yeah no I mean I mean it's yeah I, I mean without Jimmy Butler it's hard but you're right Eric Spolster's a hell of a coach first of all too. he is so it's I, hard I to bet against Miami in the playoffs yeah and yeah because Spo always has a great game plan and you're right their style of play they play so hard they they bring intensity they play with a sense of urgency uh, and you talk about a one a one game scenario all right one win win in advance kind of scenario. Yeah, it is hard to bet against them at home. Uh, so that, that should be a, a good game, mostly because both teams dealing with injuries um, and no Jimmy Butler for Miami. It's going to be – I don't know who's going to step up for him. And, and that's it. Somebody's got to step up and score some points for Miami. I don't I don't really know who that's going to be. That's, that's, that's that the thing. is If Tyler Hero decides to start playing really big, Jovich is another guy who could be good in the game, I guess. It's, I mean, like there's guys that can step up in the game. Uh, you know, Caleb, Caleb, uh, if he's Caleb Martin, if he steps up, like there's players on this team that have stepped up in, in series in the past and they could, uh, the polls, this really is though. Like I know, and I know Alex Cruz is hurt, but you have to be able to come out and try and try and go after this heat team. Uh, I know the injuries, Patrick Williams is hurt and, and Lonzo ball has missed the entire season. Zach Levine's out uh, there. You have plenty of injuries that you can look at on your own and say, uh, reasons why they wouldn't, but. I, it's just, I, it's hard for me to believe that the Bulls are not going to put up enough of a defensive effort to really try and, 
slow down this Miami team that just doesn't feel like it's going to have enough offense to get it done. Yeah, uh, that's kind of how I feel, too. Uh, the other matchup on the Western side to uh, the final play-in matchup, Sacramento at New Orleans. New Orleans right now 5-0 and versus Sacramento in the regular season. Uh, but once again, the injury bug popping up. Uh, Zion Williamson going to be out for the game with a strained left hamstring. He was an inst- unstoppable force in that first play-in versus the Lakers. He outscored uh, the rest of the starters on the Pelican squad 40-34. to We had 40 points, 10 rebounds. He's the one that sparked the comeback uh, by New Orleans, and you can make the argument that if he didn't go out of the game the last three and a half minutes, that the Pelicans win that game. Yeah. Um, so CJ McCollum and Brandon Ingram got to step up. They had terrible performances versus the Lakers. They were eight of twenty-seven combined. Uh, they got to step up because Sacramento uh, and Sacramento has been one of the healthiest teams actually in the league. They um, they've been the fourth healthiest team in the league. If you look at injuries and games lost. They still got Keegan Murray, who was awesome, versus uh, the Lakers, 32 points, eight three-pointers. Um, Sabonis, um, De'Aaron Fox, I mean, they got their core and their big three still with no Zion for New Orleans. They, they're they going to need Brandon Ingram, guys like C.J. McCollum, somebody to have a, almost a career night to uh, step up in his absence. Yeah, I mean, and you know, Malik Monk and, and Kevin Herter for, for Sacramento are big losses that they had late in the season, and they really fell off late in that season. It felt like they were maybe a bit complacent at points and hadn't figured out. They looked really good. They looked like a ton of energy and urgency uh, against uh, Golden State. The question you ask is, was this because they hate Golden State? Because this is an in-state rivalry and because of the series That's last true. year and the stepping yeah. on the chest of, of DeMontis Sabonis and all of that, was that part of the reason why it was they were so chippy and came out with that fire? And can they recreate that against the New Orleans team? that you maybe it's a little bit harder to create that fire against. That'll be the question you have to look at in this. However, it, it it feels as if this should be Sacramento. They should be able to recreate it. Brandon Ingram hasn't looked like the same guy. CJ McCollum has not looked like the same guy we've seen in the past. Uh, it, it's depth versus no depth. You know, New Orleans is the ability to throw nine to 10 guys out on this court. So if guys are not playing well, you always have someone else you can put in their, in their place. For New Orleans, if your starters don't play well for Sacramento, you're screwed because you don't have a bench right now. Malik Monk was your sixth man. He's one of the best six men in the in the league. Uh, if Keegan Murray doesn't play as well as he did, where he struggled a lot in the playoffs last season, d- played amazing in, in the play-in game so far. But uh, if he steps up, I think Sacramento has enough. I like Demonis Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox a lot. Uh, I think they'll come out with that energy and urgency. Mike Brown will be able to get him up for that game as well. Uh, New Orleans, you know, they have the talent on the team. If Brandon Ingram and C.J. McCollum want to show up, they they can easily get a win. They could probably win by double digits if C.J. McCollum and, and Brandon Ingram show up. If the, But I just don't know if they are. I, I can't bet on them to show up anymore. Yeah, they had to bench Brandon Ingram for the last seven and a half minutes. Yeah. Of that game versus New Orleans, which is crazy. Uh, but he's, he, he's the one that was dealing with injuries. Speaking of injuries, seems to be the common – the theme right now in the play in so far. I Maybe mean, he had he was coming off that uh with 12 game stint where he was out dealing with an injury. Just doesn't seem like he's found his groove coming back yet. They cannot afford to uh for him to you know uh take his time. He needs to find that groove and find his mojo. He needs to find it right away uh tonight if they got any shot. And uh also you got um Kean Ellis who uh, I saw in NBA today they believe Kean Ellis who did a great job uh is a lockdown defender on Steph in that first play. And he had three steals, three blocks in that game versus Golden State, uh, plus 27, uh, plus minus. I believe he's going to be matched up on Brandon Ingram. And right now he's playing some really high-level defense, and Brandon Ingram is playing some lackluster offense. That's not a good combination. No, and it, what, what's what's sad is in the West, like I had really – I just wanted New Orleans. If Zion could have stayed healthy, they'd win that game. Then you get Zion versus Jok- uh, Jokic which would have just been fun to see these two big guys running two big guys with the complete opposite of athleticism, <laughs> but <laughs> yes, sir, yes, those two guys going at it would have been a fun series. Uh, I would have enjoyed that a lot. And then you would have had Lakers versus OKC, which would have been so much fun to watch. Cause it would have been old guard versus the new guard. And yeah. you would, I just, it doubt those matches are great. And now we get Denver versus LA, which is fun. It's fun. Yeah. Again, we saw it last year. We've seen it. I don't know how much yeah. of a fight there is. And Oklahoma City feels like they're going to be able to take both of these teams that are just kind of limping through this last part of the season. Uh, 
it feels like they'll be able to handle their business, which good for OKC. Man, if you're a Thunder fan, you've been through a lot. So, yeah. so no, had talked right to you. I know, our, I know our friend uh, Tyler Campbell is a big OKC fan. So he is, I'm sure he is thrilled right now that this is, uh, that they're playing well. But yeah, it's going to be whoever wins this game. It's you're, you're playing with urgency. New Orleans has the better players. And I know they said two weeks to reevaluate Zion. I mean, I would push it up personally if I was playing this series, but you know, they're thinking long term. Uh, but yeah, it just doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like either one of them has really has much of a shot uh, against OKC. Uh, it, but you know, you that's why you play the games, and that's why you want to come out and show it that urgency. You want to see one of these teams really, really want it and dominate in this game, and then give you some hope for them playing against the one seed. You'd like to see that on the Eastern Conference too. Is one of these teams just really come out and show the fight that they may be put be able to put up against a one seed? Um, the uh, the OKC the OKC getting back to the the games lot they've been the healthiest team injury luck wise in the NBA a yeah. uh, big part of why they have been able to secure that number one seed yeah the Lakers I don't I don't even know if the Lakers are gonna put up much of a fight I mean they're not gonna get swept I don't think but I see this is a pretty lopsided series just based off the sample size of what we got last year. Um, you know, I think the Lakers and one thing I, I'll say this about this matchup, though, the Lakers and the uh, the Nuggets, um, if you go look at it, Denver and L.A. ranked 30th and 28th in the percentage of their shots that came from three point range um, <laughs> over the if, if you go look at it kind of over there, three kind of regular season meetings. So they don't they don't shoot a lot from three. Whoever pretty much can get hot from three um has a really good shot to you know to take control of the game early um jamal murray they don't have an answer for jamal murray they don't have an answer for Jokic either well ad can can defend him but i mean he's got he's averaging like a triple double versus ad no no and that's the the reality is everyone on the lakers to win every one of them has to have a good game and that doesn't happen a ton anymore where you see ad and lebron both putting up high you know high efficiency good games uh, that aren't just, you know, where they're shooting the ball too much to get those points up. And then you need D'Angelo Russell to play like he's played at points in this season. It looks really good. Austin Reeves to play like that. Rui Murray to play. You need all of those. Jackson Hayes is a guy that, you know, it's going to be fun to watch him run the court with Jokic not being able to run with him. Aaron Gordon can run with him pretty well, though. Uh, you know, like it's just I don't know the counter punches that you can really pull if you're the Lakers right now, but yeah. they're they're going to. You know, they made an effort of it last year, and and Denver talked a lot of trash after it. So, you know, they're going to come in fired up, but it's just, I don't know how many, I don't know, I don't feel like there's four games of LeBron, AD, D'Angelo Russell, Austin Reeves, all playing top level. Oh, my God, these guys are unstoppable basketball. I don't know if there's four games out of seven that I feel they're going to do that. Yeah, and they're not like an elite shooting team. This is a point out from three. You might have a chance to pull some upsets if you just get if you just get hot from three point range, and everybody's just unconscious from three point range. That's not really how the Lakers play. And I, I think that the I'm with you. The Denver Nuggets have too many. They present too many problems to the Lakers overall. Um, the other uh, the other series, of course, in the West that close to home, which probably may be the most competitive and the most interesting and intriguing matchup of the first round is the Clippers versus the Mavs. Um, I love your kind of your description of it uh, about these two teams. Both can be really dangerous. The Mavs have, you know, they were one of the more, um, I would say dangerous teams down the stretch of the regular season. They finished the season 16 and four. Uh, What has really changed for Dallas is their defense. You know, they got great scorers. They got guys that can win one-on-one. They got an electric backcourt with Kyrie and Luka. Uh, But the defense is something they've been trying to figure out what their defensive identity is. Since the trade deadline, they got a 111 defensive rating. um, That is seventh best in the league in that time span. Uh, You go look at the difference pre-trade deadline and post-trade deadline before the trade down day deadline the Mavs were allowing uh, nearly 33 percent of total shots near the rim um that was 13th in the nba after the trade deadline that number dipped to 30 percent that's eighth best in the nba in that time span if you go look at pre-trade mavericks opponents shot 68 percent at the rim that was 28th in the league post-trade that number is at 59 percent which is first actually in the nba in that time span it's the defense 
that has really transformed uh, this Mavs team down the stretch. Will it translate to the playoffs, especially against high level elite players like a Kawhi Leonard um, and what the, the Clippers present that remains to be seen. But if it does, the Mavs can, can be dangerous and the Mavs can win this series. There's no doubt in my mind. It could go either way. Um, I'm hoping that the Mavs win the series, but um, if they don't have an answer for um, what the Clippers are doing and Kawhi Leonard's health is, health is going to be big here, going back to the injury theme, um, I think the Mavs, uh, if they can translate that defense, the Mavs got a really good shot to win it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's if the Mavs can keep it going, and it, it goes into, too, can, you know, does Luca become a efficient player or does Luca become a usage rate player where his usage rate is really, really high, but he's not producing at the efficiency that he needs to. So he's finishing possessions. He's taking the shots or he's turning the ball over. He's doing whatever else to get that, you know, where he's controlling the game, but he shoots, you know, 15 for 35. That's not a Luca you need in this series. And then the big piece for the Mavs is you've had you've seen two different PJ Washingtons, you've seen uh, two different uh, Lewis, you've seen two different uh, Daniel Gaffords, Derek Livelys, all those guys, T Tim Hardaway Jr., all those pieces around. You know, if Dante Exum comes out and he's able to play in these series, Dante Exum, what he's brought in as a guy who's just disappeared from the league and really thought his career was over, and the resurgence he's had this year with the Mavs, guys like that, it's the role players step up for the Mavs then they can win this series because uh, the Clippers, they their role players are not necessarily as big of a factor. They, you know, they have some decent guys, but they just don't share the ball as much. You know, it's really going to come down to James Harden, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, and Russell Westbrook. Those are your four guys. Those you know, and you basically know how well most of them are going to play uh, as long as Kawhi Leonard, if he hits the court, which, again, nobody knows except for Kawhi Leonard. Uh, and so... If those guys, you figure those guys will be around average. You figure Paul George will probably have two good games out of seven where he plays really, really well and he'll play decent defense the rest of it. Uh, but he, you know, he'll have some bad, he'll have some stinkers in there too. He'll have some games where he shoots pretty poorly. Uh, so you figure Kyrie and Luca, I'm going to count on them to be pretty consistent. Yeah. And uh, I, I have some uh, sound I pulled from Kyrie that I love that this is the, the slogan for, uh, for Kyrie for what the Mavs should be. And I know they can't use it, but he says, uh, in the in the audio, he basically says he's talking about uh, playing with playing with Luca and having a guy that you really enjoy playing with. And he's yeah. like, it's good, you know, you have somebody who is really positive and the positive experience we have going on, but also you know that he's got your back and he's someone that'll empty the clip. Oh wow! And I was like, that wow. Mavs 2024 postseason yeah. slogan should be <laughs> empty the clip. Go because they had look because if you look at what the Mavs did, they emptied the clip to get the players they got. They don't have draft picks they left. They don't have really yeah. any you know commodities left to trade. Yeah. They emptied the clip to get there, and so this is the hey, put it out on the table. So I know you can't use gun stuff in slogans anymore, which is yeah, why we is. have the Red River rivalry. But yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I would say Mavs slogan for twenty twenty four playoffs should be empty the clip because that's that feels like what they need to do. Yeah, and no, it's a good point because in terms of them acquiring um, Kyrie and then what they did prior, uh, once they did at the trade deadline, and I brought up the fact that they were sixteen and four down the stretch in the season. Keep in mind that three of those losses, Luca didn't play, and they rested a lot of guys in two of the losses um, as well. So you, you're talking about at full strength, this Mavs team has one loss. Um, at, at full strength, right, with all of their available players playing yeah. since their March 5th loss to the Indiana Pacers. Like that, that's so they've been one of the hotter teams down yeah. the stretch, and I think it's kind of going under the radar. And you're right, this is kind of the, it should be all in for them because they could make a run if everything falls the right way for them, um, or at least get to see Denver in the Western Conference Finals. So yeah, but that's the thing Denver is, you know, you feel like this Mavs team is a team that can compete with the Clippers. And if you win that series, you're a team that can compete with OKC and a, a, a team that doesn't necessarily have the experience. They're a really good team. Not taking anything away from SGA, Lou Dort, Chet Holmgren, who, by the way, who had Chet Holmgren playing 82 games in a season this year. I don't think anyone had that. Everyone would have taken the under on that one. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, they have a really good team. 
Uh, and then Jalen Williams and Jalen Williams, they're both good players for OKC. They have a really good team. But when you talk about next level superstars, we're giving SGA that compliment. But Luka is a guy who can take it over. Kyrie's a guy who can take it over. They just need their role players to play closer to what OKC's role players are playing like. Uh, but you feel like they can get there. And once you get to Western Conference Finals, now it's just, you know, you're now you're in a place where you're you're a lot closer to your dream than you thought you were going to be probably at the trade deadline. This is something, but you have to get through the Clippers first. But again, that's what I say. Empty the clip. Every <laughs> every game, every series, empty the clip. Yeah, I like that. Uh, that and the Clippers, as you pointed out, they kind of present some of the same um, dangerous, uh, I think, scenarios for the, the higher seeds because they do have those stars who can take over games. You got yeah. a Kawhi that can take it over. Paul George can take it over. Russell Westbrook can take over a game. Same thing with Kyrie and Luka. Uh, and how often is that going to happen? where those guys just kind of take over things. That's going to be a fun series to watch. I can't wait to start breaking that one down this weekend. All right, we come back. We'll go behind the burnt orange curtain next segment. We'll hear from Manny Muhammad. I tell you, you're going to like this young man, and you're going to like uh, what these statements reveal about his football character. We'll get into that on the other side. Also, we'll talk about the transfer portal. It give it and it take it the way. But the Longhorns are eyeing certain specific targets in the transfer portal at the D-tackle position. Uh, we'll talk about how aggressive the Longhorns are going to be in the transfer portal coming up right here on the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Long Horn Rod Davis coming back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. We all love living in the city of Austin. What's not to love? If you're a homeowner in Austin, well, you own some of the most valuable real estate in America. Uh, the only downside of that is you actually uh, have to deal with some of the highest property taxes in the state. And many of my fellow Austinites, like you, are overpaying on your property taxes. And I was overpaying on my property taxes, too, until I found OwnWell. OwnWell can help you protest unfair property taxes and save hundreds, potentially thousands of dollars. All it takes for you is uh, three minutes to sign up at Ownwell because Ownwell believes that when it comes to paying property taxes, you should pay what's fair. And like I said, it'll only take you three minutes to sign up and there are no upfront costs or fees. Ownwell will save you money or it's free. That's the Ownwell guarantee. If you don't save, you don't pay. 86% of Ownwell's customers save on their property taxes. Ownwell handles everything from start to finish, and they deliver an average savings of over $1,100. And think about what you could do with that extra money. You can invest that back into your, into your home. Uh, maybe you can uh, beef up the savings a little bit for that rainy day fund. Uh, maybe it's time to put uh, a payment on a, a new car. Maybe you can catch up with payments on your car. Whatever you want to do, it's your money. And that's what my friends at Ownwell want you to do. They want you to pocket more of your money. And Ownwell provides you with local tax experts backed by cutting edge technology and the best in-class customer support available. Save money on your property taxes with Ownwell. Sign up in less than three minutes and start your protest today at Ownwell.com. That's O-W-N-W-E-L-L.com. Ownwell.com.
All right, welcome back to the broadcast. Let's get right to some Texas football discussion. Uh, my friends at On Texas Football, Bobby Burton and the crew, uh, did a live stream with them earlier this weekend. Bobby said he believes that Texas could take as many as two D tackles in this spring transfer portal window. Uh, remember, they already have Tia Savea on campus, who they brought in uh, via the transfer portal from Arizona at the interior defensive line. Uh, but now uh, they are targeting, reportedly targeting multiple defensive linemen in the transfer portal. Uh, now, we know about Bill Norton. For those who don't know, uh, Bill Norton is the Arizona uh, defensive uh, tackle who uh, has obviously ties to Arizona and ties to Johnny Nansen, just like Savea did. Both those guys played at Arizona where Johnny Nansen was the uh, defensive coordinator there and uh, linebackers coach. So there's a, a, a familiarity with the system, but also um, you can vet the player. You can vet the character because Johnny Nansen knows them already. Um, Bill Norton would be a, a reportedly a graduate transfer if Texas could acquire him. Um, so he all, he's a guy that, right now for Texas could be a priority just because of the familiarity with the system. And it might be more of a seamless transition. And you also need to need someone to be an a gap, a, a gap disruptor. Now, the problem may not be with development overall of the interior defense lineman you have on campus right now. It just may be fit. If those guys are more three techniques and not nose tackle, traditional nose tackles. And last year you had two guys that could play nose tackle for you. Byron Murphy could do it if you needed to. And Tavondre Sweat could do it if you needed Tavondre Sweat to do it. And now that you lost both of those guys, you don't really have a natural nose tackle on the roster right now. Now, Tia Savea, uh, he's great because uh, Savea's a guy that can play nose for you. He has a history at, tech, at, at Arizona, excuse me, of playing uh, nose tackle. So that's a guy that can do it. Um, Bill Norton's a, a player who has a history of 42% of his snaps were in the A gap. So he can play the A gap and be an A gap disruptive, baby, a true nose tackle. Um, uh, another player that is out there is Dominique Williams. He reportedly is going to hit the transfer portal. He's from TCU. And uh, Dominique Williams is a uh, defensive tackle. I believe he's going to be a junior coming in um, because he uh, had two years. His first, his two seasons at TCU, Williams registered 10 tackles for loss, five sacks, 60 tackles, 28 defensive stops, 30 quarterback pressures, and three quarterback hits. From what I hear, this is a guy truly that has an NFL upside and a Sunday skill set. He would be the – he'd be the – the diamond of that group. He'd be the jewel of the group that you bring in on those D tackles, be the transfer portal. He's the guy ideally that you want. If you had to choose one of these guys, he'd be the one that you choose six, two, three, 20. He is actually from Torrance, California. The reason that may sound familiar to us, because that's where Sark is from. That's Sark's hometown. I don't know how big that town is. And, in terms of degrees of separation, um, what would it take to get him uh, to Texas? But he is, he has already planned a visit to Texas. He's going to visit Texas, uh, coming up April 23rd and 24th. He's also visiting Oklahoma, visiting Colorado, visiting LSU, visiting Missouri and Oregon. So he is highly sought after. But like I said, he is the prize. If you can get him that and, and he would help you uh, in multiple years. He's not just a guy that's going to be a one year addition for you um, like uh, Bill Norton would be as a graduate transfer. There's also the young man, Jay Toya. Uh, Jay Toyer, take Toya, excuse me is a UCLA uh, defensive lineman who announced that he was going to hit the transfer portal. Uh, he tweeted out, as I prepare to graduate from UCLA, he's also going to be a graduate transfer. Um, he says, after speaking with my parents, my family have decided to enter the NCAA transfer portal as of last night. So he's got one season of eligibility as well, just like Bill Norton. There's also a connection with Johnny Nansen here. Because Johnny Nansen was the D-line coach at UCLA when this young man, Jay Toya, was uh, first recruited there. So he knows Coach Nansen because Coach Nansen was his coach, his position coach there at UCLA. So Johnny Nansen's connections, which is crazy, is more than a coincidence, Patrick, his connections alone – have brought you uh, Tia Savea already at the interior D-line, but it also could bring you Bill Norton, a player who played under him, and Jay Toya, potentially. Three D-linemen who all have relationships, pre, pre prior relationships with Johnny Nansen. That is serendipitous, to say the least. That is a hell of a coincidence and a hell of an added value of bringing in a coach like Nansen. Yeah, it's also, I'm sure, something that when they were looking at guys to bring in, they wanted to bring in guys that had good relationships with their players, and, you know, you never know when that could come in handy. 
that, hey, he's been around. He's been to a few different places, and everyone seems to talk very highly of him. And the players that we've, you know, that we've reached out to, they all like him too. So maybe if we need to, we need to grab somebody from somewhere and he knows them, maybe we could get him. Now, like I said, Bobby said they could take two of these guys. I imagine Bill Norton and Jay Toyo would be the easiest just because of the connection with Johnny Nansen. But like I said, Dominique Williams is the one you you know that you really want. I mean, like I said, he's the prize. Gives you more than one year of eligibility to help you stabilize the position. Um, but also, I think he's got the highest upside of all these guys as well. And, yes, all these guys can play nose. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Dominique Williams spent 53% of his time in the A-gap of his 40, 477 snaps. So he can play A-gap for you. Bill Norton, as I pointed out, uh, 50% close of his snaps, um, between 45 and 50% of his snaps are also A-gap snaps uh, for him as well. And when you go look at Jay Toya, um, for Jay Toya, he had – 154 of his 383 snaps were in the A gap. So he can do it too. All these guys, they can be A gap disruptors for your traditional nose tackles. That's what Texas needs. When you play certain teams, it's not going to affect Texas in like nine of the 12 games, but they're going to be through probably three matchups Michigan, Georgia, maybe Kentucky where they'll have the resources and the personnel to be able to run power gap schemes against you. And that's where you're going to be weakest because you lost to Andre Sweat and Byron Murphy. It left a void there, especially at the nose tackle. That's right up the, the, the guts of your defense. And although Anthony Hill is really talented, he's still a young linebacker. And when you run at young linebackers, you test their technical proficiency at playing the position, which is why Micah Parsons, elite athlete in the NFL, one of the best athletes in the league, and one of the greatest pass rushers actually in NFL history already. But when you run at him, you make him an average run defender and turn him into less of an impact player. You can do the same thing with Anthony Hill. And I think that's what teams are going to try to do against Texas. And you play keep away. You keep the ball away from the Texas' prolific offense. And you just convert with three yards in the cloud of dust right up the guts of that Texas defense. It's demoralizing. And also it, it, it attacks the only weakness of the defense without having to worry. And it, it, it actually, if you look at it, it mitigates all, all the strengths, right? It, you don't even have to worry about the strengths. He eliminates them. You don't have to worry about the edges as much anymore. You don't have to worry about Anthony Hill's speed, sideline to sideline. You don't really have to worry about the secondary, which I think is going to be a strength this year too. So you negate all their strengths by just running the football simply right at them with power concepts. Texas has to counter that. The way to counter that is A-gap disruptors, force run defenders, which yeah. is that's what they're working on right and, now. And, and the two number doesn't seem that crazy when you say they've already lost two D linemen. Yet they were edges, but they've already lost two D linemen to the portal. So you'd, you'd be replacing yeah. two edges with two interior D linemen and they'd be older, not younger, but you'd still be basically replacing you, the D line room would still as a whole have the same amount of scholarships and people on it. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, you're still deep on the edges, even with those guys leaving. Yeah, exactly. You still got Collins Emmons and you got, you know, Baron Sorrell, Ethan Merck, and you got Trey Moore you're bringing in. You're still really deep there. All right, let's get to a couple of these cuts from uh, Manny Muhammad, which I think are interesting. Uh, the first one he was asked, and I think it's kind of, it kind of shows you his overall personality. He was asked why he plays the, the, the position with such confidence as a young player, right? He has, he's only a sophomore um, started at the end of last season. He's going to start this year. Why, where does his confidence come from? Here's what Manny Muhammad had to say. I don't want to say I've been playing for a long time, but I've been playing a position uh, since I was like in sixth grade. Uh, and I had a uh, very great uh, high school coaches. Uh, and then, you know, we got the bloodline of corners uh, in my family. Um, but I always want to put God first because without him, I, I, I can't achieve none of this. Um, and then, like, just knowing the game, learning the game, and then that's, that's really it. Um, I do think that matters, though. I mean, he is seen as a technician and, and, and someone who studies the game, trying the mastery of the cornerback position. He's been playing it since sixth grade. He's in his second year in college. He's been basically playing the cornerback position for eight going on nine years already. I, when I, by the time I got to my sophomore year at college, Patrick, I've been playing the position since my ninth grade year. So that's ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th. I've been going on my it was five, going on six years of playing the position. He's been playing the position already three years and three years longer than I was. And the light kind of went off for me in that seventh year, studying the position, learning the position. You know, that's why he may be mature beyond his years. 
the guy, most cor- most players who are really great athletes, they end up moving around a lot early on in middle school and in high school, and then they specialize by the time they get to college or later on in their high school career. This guy started specializing in middle school. Yeah. That is rare for football players early on. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and I, I, it's also he went to some good programs that yep. you know he was he wasn't just playing the position; he was being taught the position and being taught to learn in, in a bunch of pieces where he's been able to spend good years at the position, not, well, I spent two years that was me just playing around, and yes, then exactly. we got there. He spent yeah. good years doing it. That's a great point, a high level against high-level competition, too. We'll yeah. get into that later on. Um, he was asked also where he has improved the most during spring ball. Here's what Manny Muhammad had to say. I like to work on uh, everything in my game uh, as far as my area quickness, um, stand up field on the top shoulder, uh, tackling my angles, um, knowing when and knowing where my help is, when I can uh, break on certain routes, uh, when I can play high sometimes. Oh, I wanted to play that cut for the last part of it. And when he's talking about what he works on, and I love that he mentions, I got to know where my help is so I can know how to break on boss. He's talking about cheating. He's talking about cheating certain routes. I know where my help is. If I got help inside, all right, that means I can I can jump anything inside. I, I can jump because I got inside help. So if he runs a slant, I'm jumping it. I'm jumping routes. That's basically what he's talking about without saying it. Love the way he thinks. That's, that's a cerebral player. Where is your help? Because that will determine a lot of times your leverage and how aggressive you can be. Ooh, man. Uh, the more I listen to Manny, the more I like him. Um, he was asked also about John Tay Cook and their relationship. I remember CJ Vogel asked this, um, and he was asked about him and John Tay Cook. They knew each other, really good friends in high school, but now as teammates, how they help each other improve their game. I mean, we always, I mean, during practice, we'll be talking to each other like, ah, what did I do wrong right here? Like, if he'll beat me, he'll be like, ah, you should have did this better. Or if I um, win on a rep, I'll be like, hey, you should have did this better. That's how you could have got me right here. And then after practice, we'll do the same thing and then just laugh about it. And then we'll watch tape together like when we go in the cold tubs and the hot tubs. Uh, that is important. Like I said, I remember those sessions against guys like Shanahan and Sims and, and Bo Scaife and my man Montreal Flowers were all played offense. And they would win a rep or I'd win a rep. And then there would be a conversation immediately after. Like, hey, man, you know, if you'd have looked me off, just say half a second longer that I would have turned my hips the other way. Or if you'd have given me another stutter step here, you'd have been able to create more separation. That's about winning the chess, the individual chess match within the game. And I'm glad those guys are doing it. I heard Jalen Ford talking about that with Malik Murphy last season. That should be happening on the lowest levels, not only with coaches and players, but also player to player. Uh, speaking of player to player, he was asked he was asked about Makuba and what Makuba has done uh, as a new addition to the secondary. Here is Malik Muhammad. Uh, Makuba has came along r- really well. Uh, I think he's going to be a big player for us in a, in a, in a back end. Uh, he communicates well. Uh, and then sometimes when he's such a bet, sometimes when uh, someone does something wrong, he'll make them right. Oh, I love the last part of that. When somebody somebody's wrong, he makes them right. I remember those that Ahmad Brooks was like that, a former cornerback, uh, former quarterback, actually played cornerback and then safety. Um, and he would see – like a linebacker about to bust a coverage or a linebacker not about to drop to the right depth. And either he would correct it beforehand um, and, and try to make sure beforehand that he would warn the linebacker, hey, man, just so you know, you got to drop back. you got 12 yards depth that you got to drop back. you got to be there for that curl route. Or afterwards, he, he would understand, all right, after the ball snap, I see that linebacker cheating. He doesn't even recognize that he's supposed to shift or bump the coverage. All right, I understand. I will take care of my responsibility, but still cover his behind it just in case there is a coverage bus. Got to have those kind of guys, and Makuba seems to be one of those kind of guys. Uh, last cut here, he was also asked, you know, what excites you most about this young secondary? Here's what uh, Malik Muhammad had to say. Uh, the depth, uh, us being young but old at the same time. Um, we got physical, like, guys that can fly around, make plays on the ball, all that, yeah. Uh, I love that. Yeah. Young and old at the same time. Young guys <laughs> who played a lot. Old souls. I like I like the way that uh, Manny Muhammad talks about football. All right. We come back. We got off the record on the other side. Uh, got some funny audio that we'll play for you guys. Uh, the uh, GM for the uh, Jaguars is uh, 
going viral for all the wrong reasons, uh, but funny reasons. We'll talk about that when we come back. All of that and more right here on the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Longhorn. Rod Davis coming back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Long Hunt Rod Babers here. Let me tell you about uh, my friends over at Iron Workers Local Union 482. Uh, they do a great job in this city. As a matter of fact, a lot of the iconic landmarks that we see in this city every day, uh, like Pennybacker Bridge and DK Stadium, were actually uh, built and created by the skilled craftsmanship of Iron Workers Local 482. And right now, they're constructing another big project right here in Central Texas, and they need your help. They're hiring over 3,000 people for a huge project right here in Central Texas. They're offering competitive wages, competitive benefits and a pension plan they even offer training for unskilled labor through their apprenticeship program so if you're thinking about uh, an exciting employment opportunity or maybe you want a refreshing career change or maybe you want a new challenge or you want to feel valued by your employer you're going to become a valued member of this prestigious organization iron workers local union 482 maximize your potential and accept the challenge of becoming the best version of yourself by going online to apply at ironworkers 482.org that's ironworkers 482.org
All right, welcome back to the Rodcast. We'll get right to it because I know we're up against it here. So uh, far off the record, got a couple of pieces of audio here. The first one comes from the uh, Kelsey Brothers podcast that they do. So apparently Jason Kelsey lost his Super Bowl ring. Uh, he talks about it on the New Heights uh, podcast. I'll just let him tell you the story. After that event, and we went right to Jason lost his ring, where we had a full vat of Skyline oh Chili. God. This is actually technically a three-way. It's not just Skyline Chili. There's spaghetti in there, cheese, and chili. The video does not do justice just how disgusting this was. I had to get away from that corner. I went to Skyline twice over the weekend. I love Skyline Chili. This chili had been sitting out for like some oh. time period. It smelled so bad in that part of the arena. Mixed into that chili were socks with make-believe rings. And then there's actually only one real ring in there, which was my Super Bowl ring, that they had to try and find. One in each pool. But there was an unfortunateness. Uh, as you guys know, this game existed because I continually lose my Super Bowl ring. Um, and I don't even know if Travis still knows this. But I legitimately lost my Super Bowl ring in this event. They could not find it. This is Jets Jake searching through the chili to try and find the sock that had my Super Bowl ring in it. We have still yet to find it. What did you expect to happen? I thought that we would just go in the pool and get the ring afterwards. You're such a f***ing imbecile. Greg got a metal detector. There's actually metal in Skyline Chili. There's traces of iron within the chili itself. So it, it's an impossible task to try and use a metal detector. That's so good. There's probably lead as well in there. Some <laughs> it's just a hunk of metal. I'll just have another one made, I think. They can do that, right? I don't know, Jason. Probably. I guess we're going to find out. <laughs> dude, that dude is so funny, man. And yeah. whatever he's going to do at the football, like, I'm in. I'm in. Whether yeah. it's a simulcast, whatever. That dude's hilarious. So, someone, stole that, someone stole that ring, right? Somebody stole that ring. Yeah, yeah of course yeah. he did. That, that ring yeah, was yeah. either never in the chili or someone found it in the chili and just walked away with it. It was like, yeah, it's a real Super Bowl ring. It's Jason Kelsey's Super Bowl ring. I'm going to steal and, this. And I'm going to say inside job. I'm yeah, gonna I say that, that like the fan. I'm gonna say it was an inside job. Might have been yeah. stolen before they even put it out there. Yeah, that's you why I can't mean? find it because it was gone. Exactly, gone. Yeah, it was never in there. Actually, no. <laughs> you know what I mean, I think it's something like that. I'm with you. There's no way it was lost. No freaking way. Somebody either found it and then revealed that they found it, or it was an inside job taken before they even put it out there to Chile. But only Jay, only. Uh, only uh, tr uh, J Jason Kelsey would let a, a, an organization even do that. Like, nobody's yeah. like, hell no, you put my Super Bowl ring in some three way chili. By the way, three way chili is a thing. They put split, yeah, Skyline say, Chili is that's what Sky. Wow. It's a big thing in Cincinnati in the Ohio Man. region. And they're they're this, I believe, they're talking about when they did the New Heights in Cincinnati. And they did the fake graduation with Travis Kelsey chugged the beer after uh, they were doing a okay. live show in Cincinnati because that's Man. where they play college. So I think yeah, I think that was the deal. It was it's a big deal in Ohio. We're still arguing about beans and chili here in Texas. They putting like spaghetti noodles and all kind yeah. of stuff in it. Yeah, I, I think they're say, and then they had cheese. I don't because I I yeah. feel like I could do chili and in in noodles, and I could do chili and cheese. But I feel like all three of them together, I feel like oh. somehow the noodles and cheese doesn't work. It, no way it works. Yeah, not that kind of cheese. That no. kind of cheese they're talking about. Like, yeah, I'm with you. That's. But hey, man, to each his own, to each his own. I ain't going to hate on it. Okay, last little piece of audio here, and then we're moving on. <laughs> this is actually pretty funny. So Trent Balky, who is the GM of the Jaguars. By some just, unknown reason, still the general manager. Still the general manager. They dressed buddy. up as clowns once to mock this guy. And he's, <laughs> it's like years ago, and he still got his job. That's a great point. I forgot all about that. You're right. Uh, well. This time he's being mocked for different reasons. Here's the audio of Trent Balky and why he's going viral for all the wrong reasons. Still got a couple of days uh, going through. Coach and I haven't sat down and go, excuse me, gone through the final board yet. <laughs> he just he just ripped one, and he, you know what? Good for him. He asked manners. He said, "Excuse me," but he just 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 ripped one right there. I'm, I'm going to tell you the best part it. about it is not the excuse me roll on. It's the split second where he stops talking. I'm going to play it for you again. The split second where he <laughs> stops talking before to know it's coming and not try and talk over it. He needs to focus for it a second. But I haven't sat down and go, excuse me, gone through the fire. He stops. <laughs> he stops. He stops to fully focus on it, like, ugh, to rip it real good. Oh, man, that is real. I thought that was like some AI-generated <laughs> hoax or something. Nope, that is real. It is making the rounds there, folks, and it is fantastic. Good for him. All right, there you go. We come back. Uh, one more hour left in the show. We'll address the uh, the NFL draft rumors that are dropping some uh, players' draft stock. 
best players in college football, at least the top 100 ranked by CBS Sports. Rod's round the day, which is spring game related. We'll tell you what concepts and schemes uh, you're sure to see at the spring game. Um, and also we'll dive into some of the other big topics of the day. Another horn headlines as well. All of that and more right here on the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Longhorn. Rod Babers coming back on the horn. Mm-hmm. 
All right, welcome back to the Rodcast. It is a 512 Friday. That's when Patrick plays jams from local bands and artists that you have a chance to catch live right here in the ATX. Uh, what are we jamming right now, Patrick? This is the Reverend Few, and they're playing tonight at the Far Out Lounge. I like this groove, man. I like it. This is nice. Yeah, very talented um, band. It is very talented. I like this stuff. Um, what's the name of this song? Uh, Ain't No Place to Be. Ain't No Place to Be. All right, I'm going to write that down. Kind of like that. Um, all right, my Patrick, always hooking us up on a 512 Friday. Also hooking us up with the big fat poll of the day, which is related to the spring game. It's already posted uh, at the Horns Twitter account, so you can go check that out uh, at Horn FM uh, in, the Twitter, in, in the Twitterverse at the Horn ATX, excuse me. Um, but you can also go uh, to the text line where this, they're, they're, shall, they're, they're surely discussing the big fat poll of the day. That's 512-447-3776. Patrick, let the people know what the topic of the big fat poll of the day Vegas. Big fat poll of the day today. Who will be the standout player of the Texas spring game? Who will stand out the most? And we say we know that most likely Quinn is not going to play a ton of snaps, and some of the older guys may not play a ton of uh, series, so they may not be out there a ton. Uh, the ones we put up on the fall online were Arch Manning, John Tate Cook, Malik Muhammad, and uh, Anthony Hill. Uh, John Tate Cook, run away with it right mm -hmm. now. The wide receivers always have a way to look good in the spring game, usually play a few more reps come in and out of the game. So he's definitely someone that could have a, a big spring game. And I think a lot of people want to see Arch have a really good one. Yeah, Arch is second right now in the voting. Uh, John Tate Cook, you're right. He's, he's running away with this thing. Um, I'll go with, you know, in terms of who I think is going to have uh, be a standout player, who will be the standout player of the Texas spring game. I might end up going with the running backs. I feel like wide receiver, they're going to have a lot of distribution of snaps and reps because we got so many uh, wide receivers out there. Um, I feel like running back may end up being one of those guys. I'm with you. I mean, either Trey Wisner or Jaden Blue. And I'm hearing that we're going to see more, you know, two tailback sets, more of that pony package uh, they're throwing out there. But I hear the pony package is Trey Wisner is the other back. So it's not necessarily always C.J. Baxter and Jaden Blue in the backfield together. But you're getting a C.J. Baxter with a Trey Wisner, a Jaden Blue with a Trey Wisner. So a one, two, three punch. And, you know, Sarkis also throwing out there three back sets before we saw three back sets at times um, so i don't know what you call the three back sets if you call the two back sets a pony what do you call three back sets is it a donkey is it a stallion like i don't know what it's called i think donkey is kind of weird but kind of kind of cool i don't know the donkey packet the donkey uh so either way um <laughs> I, I might go with running back i might go with running back i might I'm, i feel like uh i feel like a Jaden blue we've been hearing a lot about Jaden blue yeah um and, and actually we have a uh, someone who replies to your uh tweet at the horn atx about the big fat poll today they Tony says Jaden Blue. Those are Jaden Blue. Yeah, out there. I, I like, feel like Jaden Blue might have a big day. I, I'm with you. I think Jaden Blue could have a good one too. I always think the wide receivers are going to do good, but yeah, you could be right. The wide, the running backs. I think Jaden Blue could have a really good one. CJ Baxter probably won't play a ton, but he's still young, exactly. so he could. Yeah. Sophomores, you know, you could put your sophomore out there a little bit more. Uh, Trey Wisner also someone to watch out for that I think will probably get a ton of carries because yeah. he's just been talked about so much. I think he may want to reward him with playing in front of the crowd. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the crowd <laughs> on Saturday. Seriously. Uh, and uh, I think Trey Wisner could have some. So if he breaks a few, then he'll open even more eyes. So we'll see with that. But that'd be an interesting one to watch too. If I had to choose a wide receiver, I like the John Tate Cook um, choice. Uh, you know, don't, you know, don't forget about Ryan Wingo. I know he's yeah. a freshman, but I've been hearing great things about him in practice. He's even gotten some reps rotating with the ones in practice. That's how good he's been doing. When Sark, when Sark was asked about what freshmen have stood out, the only one that he was willing to single out name was Ryan Wingo. And Ryan Wingo has probably the best combination of speed, twitchiness, agility, and size since Roy Williams. Um, at Texas at the wide receiver position. I'm not saying that he's the best wide receiver since where we in terms of the combination of physical tools and traits. You probably got the best combination there at wide receiver since Roy. And he's a problem. And Sark has even remarked that he's, a, he's he's not even a refined route runner yet, but he's presenting a problem just because of his physical freakishness. And I wouldn't doubt if he ends up making a couple of big plays. Maybe he doesn't have a lot of receptions, but maybe just has one big, long, deep ball that – you know, maybe has three receptions throughout the game, but makes that one or two big plays. He may be one of those guys to watch in terms of who's a standout because he's going to look different too. 
He looks different than the rest of the wide receivers. The rest of the wide receivers, remember, Sark has a type. They're small-ish, you know, uh, their frames are slight-ish. They're, they're speed demons. They all can run. Ryan Ringo can run, 10, 500-meter run, but he's big. He got size, like 6'2". It looks different out there. Yeah. And I wonder if uh, Lohan fans, well, I don't wonder if they'll notice. I know they'll notice it, but I wonder if it'll uh, translate into the spring game uh, immediately. So a good question there for the big fat poll of the day. Um, I like that. So go check it out at the Horn ATX. Um, and you can go uh, also discuss it on the, uh, in the, in the text, uh, the, on the text line there as well. 512-447-3776. Uh, okay. Before we get to the Horn headlines here, and we're also going to talk, draft rumors some are helping the draft stock of certain players and some are hurting the draft stock of certain players uh for texas we'll get to that and also uh bucky brooks ranking the top five players at every position and cbs ranking the top 100 uh players in college football and where the longhorns are ranked i uh i am seeing this weird video though that's making around cbc to me too of michael parsons training with like a professional boxer and they are essentially trading shots in the gut. Basically, Micah gets to hit him in, yeah. the, in, in the abdomen, and then they just trade shots. Then he gets to hit Micah in the abdomen. Hey, man, you got to be careful with that with a professional boxer, though, Micah. I know yeah, you're a great what, athlete, but, it's what, dude. It's, that, it's, what, it's what killed Houdini. It is what killed Houdini. That's exactly what I was thinking about. <laughs> First thing that came to my mind was like, that's how Houdini died. Yeah, because the story was that basically who did that was part of one of his acts, but then some idiot came up and did it to him when he wasn't ready. Yeah, it was like punched him in the gut a couple of times, and who then he developed like a what appendicitis or something. Yeah, something, something like that. Yeah, but he did it when he wasn't ready, and that's yeah. But yeah, come on, <laughs> I appreciate man. that we're the same people saying we go punch in the gut by by boxer. That's how Houdini died. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the first thing I thought of, I'm glad me and Patrick thinking the same. They're like, dude, that's how Diddy died. Don't be doing that, man. That's crazy. All right, there you go. So hopefully Michael Parsons is uh, – he's, he's ready for those gut shots, so he's not being taken by surprise. But still, man, that guy's hands are, are a weapon. You don't want to be uh, having that guy hit you in the stomach, no doubt. All right, anyway, uh, aside from that, let's get to the horn headlines. Then we can get to talking about some of these draft rumors, unfortunately, that may be dropping this draft stock of some of your favorite longhorns. Uh, let's let my man Patrick uh, inform us, educate us, and – and update us on the big headlines of the day with the Horn Headlines. All right, your Horn Headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Texas baseball will look to get their season back on the right track in their weekend series with TCU starting tonight. The Longhorns are 1-4 and four in series openers in Big 12 play this season, not winning an opening game since Texas Tech March 8th. But Texas pitching will hope to get a break against a team that has not scored more than four runs in a game since March. Texas softball will take the record of six straight wins against ranked teams to Kansas this weekend to take on the Jayhawks. Sophomore catcher Reese Atwood will look to make history as she's only six RBIs away from setting the single season RBI record at Texas. In the NBA, the final playing games will be settled tonight with the Bulls taking on the Heat and the Kings facing the Pelicans. Both Jimmy Butler and Zion Williamson will miss their respective games due to injuries suffered in the seven versus eight matchups. Despite the injury, uh, the Heat are still favored to beat the Bulls. However, Sacramento gets a slight edge against New Orleans. In Major League Baseball, the Rangers withstood a tough first outing for rookie Jack Leiter, who gave up seven earned runs in three and two-thirds innings to win 9-7 to seven and win the series against the Tigers. In action starting to get today, the Astros will start a series against the Nationals with Justin Berlander returning from injury, and the Rangers will begin their series with the Braves with pregame beginning at 545 right here on the horn and that is your horn headlines all right thank you patrick for the horn headlines also cannot forget about the rangers report we're going to get to that here uh also in the nine o'clock so we may push Rod's rant uh which is spring football related may push that to next segment uh we'll also kind of throw in the uh, the college of football top 100 rankings list from cbs sports uh so we'll get it all in i promise you uh but let's start with these draft reports that are uh, some of them, like I said, it's just downright salation. I remember we heard Deion Sanders straight up say he used to work the NFL draft, um, and he knows that there are NFL teams that actually put out negative reports about players before the draft to drop their draft stock. He's, some of it is true. Some of it's half true. Some of it's just straight up false. They just make it up as they go along. Um, and that's happening right now, I think, to a lot of players, of course, but I think it's happening to a couple of Texas players. Uh, A.D. Mitchell is one guy it's happening to. Now, this comes from Bob McGinn, 
Um, he claims that he is uh, talking to certain NFL scouts who are uh, giving him this information. They are anonymously, of course, giving him this information. Um, so I'll read the excerpt from his report about A.D. Mitchell. He said he's got Garrett Wilson S catch radius, athletic ability, body control, but he's almost uncoachable before you even get to the diabetic part. He's kind of going to do it his way. He's a little bit of a wild horse. You've got to see if you can harness him in. Then once you do that, he doesn't address the diabetic stuff in a mature way. He's very much a boom or a bust type guy. He has been diagnosed as type one diabetic. You're going to have to assign somebody to be next to him for his first few years because his issues are all about his diabetes and his blood sugar. Um, and he I said that that was from a second scout. Uh, another scout said when his blood sugar is off, he's rude. He's abrasive. He doesn't pay attention in meetings. It's why you get really, really iffy. I mean, they didn't use the word iffy uh, character reports coming out of Georgia and Texas. But when his stuff is normal and they get him normal by lunchtime, he's out at practice, high energy, best practice player, loves football. A third scout said diabetes was a major concern. You've got to look out for it. And he's got to take care of himself. He said every diabetic does. There are some questions. But at the end of the day, he's a good player that hasn't done anything overly malicious. He's probably just immature. Um, like I said, we didn't hear anything about these reports at Texas about him being uh, unselfish or abrasive or even the diabetes or anything like that. So uh, we didn't hear about that. This is more before the draft, and I'm not saying this unsubstantiated, but it could be teams trying to drop AD's draft stock. Yeah, right it, before it, we, and we know where we can see. We were here the report that Adam Schefter says that he's could be taken above where he's projected. Yes. That maybe there are teams out there that are hoping that he falls to the late late first round and they can get a snag at him without having to trade up. That could be a possibility. It is funny that the reports of all these people basically sounds like a Snickers commercial. <laughs> that's, that's true. The report is don't draft this guy. You're not yourself when you're hungry. <laughs> these the scouting reports that these he guys hangry. He gets hangry all the time. He's very hangry. You don't want this guy on your team. So uh, that's I, a great point. But yeah, I do think this is probably something that it sounds like because again, me and Rod, we've never heard this stuff from Texas. I've never yeah. seen this report from Texas. I could believe that someone in Georgia had this report that it was somebody that dealt with him his freshman year, possibly, mm -hmm. and maybe you know going into college didn't know how to deal with things as well going into a new environment, learning all the new pieces that possibly the change. And then you add in a maturity, add in the fact of dealing with diabetes, all of that could yeah. add into a factor of his freshman year. It could have been a problem. It did not seem to be a problem. No reports of it last season. So I, I wouldn't bother me as much if I was talking to the Texas people and saying, if it was immaturity, it does not seem like it's still there. Exactly. It, that's a great point. If it was not maturity, it was just that. And now he has become a mature. And we know that he came to Texas to spend more time with his kid, right? Yeah. To, uh, with his daughter, I believe. And he said that was one of the reasons because he wanted to be uh, there for her more. But he also, uh, part of being a parent, I'm sure he wanted to be a more mature, responsible parent yeah. um, to, to the young lady. Uh, so I, I think that, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think you made a good point there that if these reports – are indeed of some substance. It's from this time at Georgia. It, I don't think it's from his time at Texas. We would have heard. We cover this program too close. There are too many great platforms, websites that do a really good job covering Texas football. There would have been at least one report about A.D. Mitchell yeah. being a bad teammate, you know, not necessarily fitting into the culture. At least one. There was nothing. Like nothing at all like that. Only thing I remember about A.D. Mitchell is stuff I've seen on film. He wasn't an enthusiastic blocker at first. All right. But then he, he did better toward the end of the season. And yes, there are times where he frustratingly, I think, would give up on routes if he wasn't the guy um, that was going to get the football. That could be a maturity on the field. But that's stuff we saw on the field. That ain't stuff about him as a teammate and then and not matching up with the culture. We never heard anything like that. So could just be I'm with you. If it is true or some of it's true, then it's coming from his time at Georgia. Good point there, Patrick. OK, another player from Texas that also is having their draft stock negatively affected, by the way. And this is also. They're doing as well because uh, Tavondre Sweat did get charged with a DWI, so that's on him. That was a bad decision. But, man, now some of the reports that are essentially reaffirming or confirming the red flags that he had on his draft evaluation even prior to the combine. 
So uh, Dane Brugler, uh, sorry, Dane Jeremiah is this one. Dane Jeremiah is saying that now uh, Tavondre Sweat could even drop, that he can't see him being drafted in the first two rounds. He says, uh, to me, the third round would be the earliest I could see him going. And I wouldn't be shocked if he didn't go uh, go on day two and ended up going somewhere on day number three. Um, and he's obviously talking about Tavondre Sweat's latest issues uh, with the DWI arrest. Remember, Dane Brugler pointed out that he had to reassure teams that he was no longer a, a guy that was going to party, that he was going to prioritize football um, and that, you know, he, he did like to have a good time, but he was being responsible about having a good time. Well, obviously, DWI arrest. It, uh, it, it flew in the face of a lot of those uh, reassurances that he was giving those NFL scouts. And now there's another report from Dane Brugler, uh, comes from Marcus Mosier, but he says one quick note from Dane Brugler on the athletic football show, Texas D tackle Devondre Sweat was quote, pushing 390 pounds in quote during the college football playoffs, which is crazy. I gotta go back and look and see, you know, how well he moved. Cause he looked like he was moving really good to be pushing 390 pounds. Let's just say that's an exaggeration. Say he was pushing 380 pounds. At least that would mean that, remember I said he, he needed to lose 12 to 15 pounds before he went to the combine, ideally? Well, maybe he did. And when he got to the combine at 366, hell, maybe if he was pushing 380, maybe he did lose about 12 pounds yeah. going to the combine. Maybe he's 367 when he went to pro day, and we kept asking, man, why isn't he trying to lose, you know, three, four, five pounds just to show the NFL scouts, hey, I can control my weight if I need to. I know it's a red flag for you guys, but I can control it. Because at 366, 367, guys, he's going to go into the NFL as the heaviest D tackle in the league. And he'll go to the – and he'll be the heaviest D tackle by like seven pounds. <laughs> um and Vita Vea is the I think right now the second heaviest D tackle and he's at 345 346 and I'm sure maybe he plays a little bit heavier than that um but yeah if he's pushing 380 if he's over 380 390 and playing weight then that's way too big but I will say he moved amazingly well if he was that big and he looked really good and you're gonna get him the lightest he's probably ever been um if you're getting him at 366 uh, in the draft but uh, that is also dropping his draft stock, Patrick. The uh, the red flags about the weight. There's some people that believe that he can't control that, and that's why he came to the combine 366, 367, because he can't really control it the way that the coaches would like him to be able to. Yeah, I, I will. I will throw in something else that I read the other day that I just looked back up. Uh, that Matt Miller, because I'll throw in a positive scouting report that I saw. Yeah. That Matt Miller did a uh, top ten mock draft where he talked to scouts. And he has scouts to do the mock draft for him for the top 10 picks. And they actually took Byron Murphy in the top 10 picks in this scouting draft. They took Byron Murphy at number nine to the Bears. They said from an AFC scout, uh, South area scouts, Murphy is a legitimate game changer who is just scratching the surface of his talent. We can't believe he's still available. Murphy on the inside and Montez Sweat on the edge will wreck things for offenses. And look at how much interior defensive tackles are getting paid today. Murphy is a huge value on a rookie contract. So that is a scout saying that he was in a top 10 value and a top 10 pick from a scout saying Byron Murphy. So that's higher than we've seen in any mock drafts where he's now slipping to the 15 to 20 range. But that scout, whoever that one is, believes some high things for Byron Murphy. Uh, I read earlier in this show, actually, that Daniel Jeremiah um, put out there via NFL Network to add to uh, what you just read there um, when it, it, the, it basically was questions to answer before the draft. He said, who might join Byron Murphy as a potential riser into the top 10? So Dan Jeremiah believes that, too. He said there are always late draft risers and prospects who go higher than expected. And Darren Jeremiah was asked about a few of his favorites. And the first one he listed was D tackle Byron Murphy. Um, for similar reasons, he says uh, in the post Aaron Donald NFL uh, so is that a top tier defensive tackles are in short supply. He said it's a league that has placed ever more premium on defensive tackles. Remember, I told you guys now D tackle is a premium position. Yeah. I've been telling you guys that for the last year or so. And you want premium positions very cheaply, just like you just brought up there, Patrick. And he says, uh, I was talking to a general manager and saying, when you look around the league and we ask who are the true impact defensive tackles, uh, maybe seven or eight of them edge rushers it goes a lot deeper than that and that's why 
to your point and to this point here that Darren Jeremiah is making, uh, Byron Murphy is rising up draft stocks. This is also why I believe that if Devontae Sweat does drop to the third round, I yeah. think a team will trade up for him. I don't think a team will let him drop to the fourth round. Outland Trophy winner, guys can see as one of the top three of five best defensive tackles in this draft. There is no way when it's becoming a premium position that teams are going to let that guy who could be an ideal fit for their system drop all the way to the fourth round. Cowboys probably should be one of the teams that thinks about trading for him in that third round. So I agree with you, Patrick. Right now, the, the fast riser in the draft, some of the pre-draft uh, rumors or pre-draft reports that are helping draft stock seems to be helping uh, my man Byron Murphy. Yeah, so it's that's crazy. News. It is crazy. Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat at, at going into the draft evaluations and like just into the season. Well, Byron will go first, but Tavondre will be pretty close after him. And now second. it is yeah. just that gap is widening. Yeah, Jim. Remember Jim Nagy, the executive bowl, uh, say executive uh, of the Senior Bowl. He said that Tavondre Sweat shouldn't 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 uh, basically drop out of the first round. Yeah, that was his. After watching him at the Senior Bowl, he's like, no, this guy should be a first round pick. And now you got people saying he should be a fourth round pick. <laughs> Unbelievable. You're Crazy. right. Just, just, yeah, they've gone in different directions in terms of their draft stock. Uh, Bucky Brooks was ranking the uh, top five players in every position. Uh, there are some Longhorns getting some love from my man Bucky Brooks. Uh, he has uh, Jonathan Brooks as his top running back on the board. Uh, overall, um, he doesn't have any of those Texas wide receivers that are ranked in his top five, so he's not really high on Texas wide receivers, slot or outside. But he's high on Jatavian Sanders, still got JT Sanders at the number two tight end on his board behind Brock Bowers. And when you look at defensive tackles, of course, he's got Byron Murphy as his number one defensive tackle, uh, in this uh draft class. And he's got uh, that, that's it, he does not have Devondre Sweat even in his top six defensive tackles. So Devondre Sweat, man, losing draft stock quickly, but I think he's going to be a hell of an NFL player and somebody's going to get uh, great value for uh, my man Devondre Sweat. All right, before we get to Rod's round the side, let's do our Rangers report here, and then we'll do the rant of the day uh, next segment, talk some spring football, but also address the CBS College Football Top 100 ranking of the best players for the 2024 season. We'll get to that coming up next segment. Right now, let's do our Rangers report, please. The Rangers Report is brought to you by Texas Truck and Trailer. All right, uh, time for our Rangers Report. I just want to give a couple of stats here about this series coming up for the Rangers uh, versus the Braves. And it, it's and I got these from uh, Jerry Sandler, uh, who does a great job as the, uh, the TV broadcaster uh, uh, for the Rangers. And um, this series coming up should be a really exciting series with the Braves for a number of reasons. So first of all, if you go look at most runs per game uh, in the ninth inning, <laughs> the Braves are number one um, and the Rangers are third in Major League Baseball in runs per game in the ninth inning. Uh, the Rangers offensive ranks through the first 20 games. And runs per game, they're ninth, so they're top 10 there, 5.15 runs per game. Uh, batting average as a team, they're fifth, 262. Um, you look at slugging percentage as a team, uh, they're 11th. OPS as a team, they're 10th in OPS as a team. So you're talking about a top 10 offense pretty easy, or even you know depending on what category you're looking at, close to a top five uh, offense. OBP, they're sixth. Um, in uh in OBP and uh, right if you go look at the Braves though the Braves in terms of being an offensive juggernaut they are arguably the best in major league baseball uh, they lead the majors in runs per game they lead the majors in batting average they lead the majors in OBP they lead the majors in OPS and slugging percentage <laughs> their team OPS this year is 841 and 841 OPS would have ranked 22nd in Major League Baseball last year ahead of guys like uh, Adelise Garcia and Julio Rodriguez, among others. So, I mean, this Braves offense is prolific, to say the least. But the Rangers offense is still pretty damn good. It's a top five, top ten offense as well. Uh, so this should be a hell of a series coming up between the Rangers and the Braves. And also watch the game. Watch if uh, Adelise Garcia has an RBI. There's a stat going around Rangers Nation. The Rangers undefeated this year, 9-0, uh, when Garcia registers at least one RBI. <laughs> uh, so keep up with that little trend for the Rangers. Uh, but, yeah, the Rangers offense has not been an issue for them. They've been able to score runs, but against the Braves, 
man, you're pitching that your pitching better have a stellar night because if it doesn't, those Braves can make you look bad, man. They can put up some, some yes, they can put up some numbers uh that are just eye popping and they can put on a show. Remember last year they were uh leading uh major league baseball in I believe it was it, it was first it was first inning runs like they would start out like gangbusters in the first inning get you at a deficit uh, ho- home runs they were one of the league leaders in home runs it's actually a really fun team to watch uh, not really fun to play against yeah they're, they're fun to watch yeah, against. yeah they're they're fun to watch <laughs> if you're not playing them. If you're not playing, that's exactly right. Uh, so the Rangers, but it's a nice, uh, it, it's a nice, you know, barometer for the Rangers. Uh, the Rangers, if you know, you come away to win in this series versus the Braves, uh, and you know that you know, obviously, that team that can score with anybody. If you can, you know, uh, pitch really well against them, um, come out and try to keep them under certain numbers offensively. Uh, at least you know that your defense is up up to the task right like i said offensively rangers have no questions rangers offense is really really impressive this season uh this would be a true test for the defense of the rangers the pitching staff of the rangers that bullpen for the rangers too all right so uh there you go that's our rangers report um and uh we uh, appreciate uh our for our fantastic sponsor for our rangers report the rangers report is brought to you by texas truck and trailer your premier truck accessory dealer all right, uh, next segment, we got our we got Raj rant of the day. We'll talk spring football. Also, the top 100 players ranked by CBS Sports uh, in the uh, for the college football season in 2024. All of that and more right here on the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Long Run. Rod Davis coming back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. I got some yard work to do this weekend, so hopefully the weather cooperates. If it doesn't, uh, that's okay. I'll get it figured out. My friends over at Callahan's General Store are helping me because uh, I'm trying to make sure that my yard is in that golf course condition. want to make sure it's beautiful and lush and healthy looking uh, and to make sure that your yard and your lawn are getting the best quality treatment available. You want to make sure you're heading on over to Callahan's General Store. It doesn't matter what you need to make sure that your yard is in top-notch condition. Maybe you got to kill those weeds out there. Maybe you got to kill the crabgrass and the dandelions out there in your yard. Well, they got exactly what you need for that. They got the pre-emergence. Uh, they have the barricade from Nitro Foss. They got the weed and feeds. You can kill more weeds, but also start to uh, build up and cultivate uh, that really good grass uh, and start to feed that good grass. And then they have uh, the, the Bermuda seed. They have all the grass seeds you need uh, to make sure you're filling in those dead patches from too much sun or from the, the winter freezes. Whatever the reason that it's damaged, uh, you can and fill it in and uh, make sure that those uh, those patches are looking healthy as well. So whether it's soil or fertilizers or uh, the amendments that you need, doesn't matter what you need uh, to make sure your yard is in top-notch care. You can find it at Callahan General Store. You also get the know-how. You get the resources. You get all the knowledge uh, about how to make sure that your yard is looking in top-notch condition. You can let them know exactly what you're dealing with, uh, what your problems are, what your challenges are, and they will help you solve that problem. They will help you meet that challenge. And also, if you're got the green thumb and you're starting to plant those vegetables, those seedling vegetables, they also have plenty of those great variety at Callahan General Store as well. Peppers, tomatoes, melons and other plants to choose from. If you're planting trees around the property right now, fruit trees and pecan trees, they also have those available at Callahan General Store. Hey, what don't they have at Callahan General Store? They got it all at Callahan General Store, 501 Bass Drop Highway between downtown and the airport. Every day is a great day to make it a Callahan's day.
All right. I uh, just want to get into some of the potential concepts and schemes you could see uh, from Sark uh, in this offense. Now, Sark's not going to unveil, you know, a lot of his new wrinkles to his offense, new cheat codes, things that he's implementing this offseason. Uh, you know, I've been talking about the red zone during uh, the spring ball and how Sark has talked to, talked about during the two scrimmages that the defense has won what they call team, which is in between the 20s, um, 11 on 11. But uh, inside the red zone that the offense has won the day. The offense has been winning more than their fair share in the red zone, and they've won the red zone period in the two scrimmages. And my theory is that Sark has been obsessing about the red zone because it was arguably the reason that they lost two games last season and didn't end up at least playing for a national title on that Oklahoma game and in the Washington game in the Sugar Bowl. And they were 120th in the country in touchdown percentage in the red zone. And so all, and over the offseason, and he probably went down a rabbit hole, looked at every rep of red zone, uh, studied every snap, studied the best red zone offenses in the NFL, so the best red zone offenses in college football, and started to steal concepts and, and cheat codes and started to adopt some of their philosophy. And he's using that in spring ball against the defense. By the way, the Texas defense was one of the better red zone defenses in the country last year. Uh, he's using that against them and doing it successfully to troubleshoot and try to figure out exactly what their red zone identity is going to be this year and why they're going to be so much more efficient and effective in the red zone. But we're not going to see that in the spring game. You're not going to see that. Um, uh, why would he start? Why, why, why would he give teams a sneak peek at what he's going to be doing? But there are certain – you know, tent poles, foundational concepts that Sark uh, uses when in his offense. He describes his offense as an RPO-based passing offense, which means all their favorite run plays, they're going to have an RPO, what they call an RPO tag on them. A tag essentially is a pass concept added to the run concept. That's your RPO, a run-pass option. So they the, the wide zone, um, the inside zone, split wide zone, split inside zone. We say split, essentially, that's when you get that um you get that tight end or that h back and they're gonna seal that backside off with that backside uh block all right and that's what they call kind of split folks it's a split it looks like it's split flow in the backfield you get that split flow and they call it the split wide zone split inside zone um and you'll get the uh, the counter tray uh, is what they kind of throw off kind of misdirection as a counter literally um, to the inside zone and the outside zone and these split versions of inside and outside zone too. And then they'll run duo, but duo is usually when they're trying to close out an opponent, they're trying to choke the clock out and that's when they run duo. So I pr you probably won't see that in the spring game, but you will see wide zone. You will see split wide zone. You will see inside zone. You will see split inside zone and you're probably going to see the counter trait. Those are their five bread and butter run plays. And off of those run plays, you've got a tag for everyone. You will have an RPO tag for all of those plays. So it's an inside zone bubble RPO. You are definitely going to see that they have the inside zone. If they have the numbers, they hand it off. If they don't have the numbers. They throw it outside to where they have the one-on-one -on -one advantage out there, and they use a bubble screen on the outside. Uh, they have the um, the RPO for the wide zone, wide zone bubble RPO. Same concepts. It's a wide zone, and the the tag is going to be that bubble RPO uh, on the backside. They have the inside zone glance or slot glance RPO. That's just the inside zone, but they tag it with their RPO. These are the basic concepts, a basic run concepts, but I guarantee you Sark is going to, you're going to see a lot of that because that's his Sark's offense. 50% of Sark's offense is play action pass, RPO based passing game, a deceptive based passing game. And then he'll also have the RPO off of the, the, uh, the counter or the counter tray. So all the favorite run concepts will have the tag on it with the RPO. You're also going to see Dagger. He if if the weather cooperates and they can throw the football downfield. Uh, Dagger is a concept. You get the number one uh, wide receiver running the dig 12 to 15 yard in cut. You'll get number two running that vertical shot down the field. And then you get the backside drag or a backside over, which is a deep drag route. And that's called dagger. So I love to run dagger. It's also one of their most explosive concepts, 21% explosive play rate on those dagger plays. Uh, that's when he wants to get the crowd on their feet. Uh, you also to try to get the, get the crowd up and get the crowd hype. Um, you, you'll see it kind of an, uh, what they call a Y cross deep rainbow crossers. Sometimes he uses the uh, Z receiver to do it. Sometimes he uses, it was the Y with JT Sanders last year, uh, but he could use a tight end to do it. It's just a 
deep over route, a deep, I call them rainbow crossers, uh, but he calls it, it's kind of the out wide cross. It's the name of the play for him, but it's a deep rainbow crossers. And you'll have those, uh, those receivers, either the Z receiver from the, the play side or the X from the backside. It could be different guys and they're running rainbow crossers and they are going to intersect. All right. Downfield, probably 15 to 18 yards. And you're just trying, they're running away from the DBs. And the only way to really cover it is to pass off those long rainbow crossers in coverage. And that's really tough to do for, for DBs to be able to pass off those routes in coverage because they're such long developing routes. So usually you'll see a match protection for that Y cross uh, sometimes uh, for Sark. He also uses sometimes a max protection on the deep curl route. He loves a deep curl route, 18, 19 yard deep curl route. Most teams don't even have a quarterback that can make that throw. That's an NFL throw, uh, but he'll do it, which also as a DB, as I once told you, I'm canceling out routes as the receiver is making his way downfield. If he gets eight yards downfield, I cancel out the slant, cancel out the out, cancel out the hitch, cancel the curl once he gets to 10. So I'm canceling out these routes in my head once a receiver gets to about 15 yards i'm ready to turn and run because almost every route after that has been canceled out except the deep movement routes like a post like a post corner like a nine route um and yet sark will will basically work against that and 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 basically work counter to that because he'll give you a curl route at 18 yards you i don't know if you'll see it in this game You, you could but you'll only see it with quinn i'm not even sure arch has the arm to make that throw malik did i'm not sure arch has the arm to make that throw you also see a lot of play action flood concepts flood is when you have three four receivers all in the same zone all in the same area of the field. You're literally flooding that area of the field or flooding that zone. He loves flood concepts, um, usually accompanied with a, a boot, a waggle, half roll by uh, the quarterback too. Um, so those are just a few. Also, the, the, the wheel concept, we saw a lot of that in the Sugar Bowl with Washington with Jaden Blue. He loves what he called the slide wheel glance RPO concept. Number one run, number one receiver runs the post route. Number two runs that wheel route. Sometimes he's a motion guy, and then you get the flare route out of the running back. Or maybe it's um, it could be a flare route, or it could be just an arrow route with an arrow, which is a quick beeline out to the flats. Uh, and then that concept almost works kind of like a flood concept, but then you get that wheel route and you basically force the, the safety to decide between defending that post or defending that wheel or trying to play play it in between. If you try to play it in between, you could lose out on both. So there you go. That's some of the concepts you could end up seeing uh, in the spring game, some of the favorite concepts, go-to concepts for a Sark offense. Really quickly, because I promised you this, so I want to get to it. CBS Sports ranked the top 100 players in all of college football for the 2024 season. Five Longhorns getting some love here. We'll start at the top and work our way to the, the, the highest rank to the lowest rank. Kelvin Banks, highest ranked Longhorn on this list. He is ranked 10th, so the 10th best player in college football. They have Isaiah Bond, 14th. They have Isaiah Bond is the 14th best player in college football on this list. Quinn Ewers is 15th uh, on this list. They have C.J. Baxter as 76th best player in college football, and they have Trey Moore, the edge rusher for Texas. Getting a lot of love. Remember, uh, ESPN had their 10 top edge rushers, and they had Trey Moore among the top 10 edge rushers in college football. So Trey Moore getting some love coming off that 14-sack season last year uh, with UTSA. Definitely with your best. He'll be the best pass rusher, natural pass rusher on the Fort Acres, and he might have the best BGL ball get-off of any of those Longhorn edge rushers they bring in. Surprised not to see Jaday Barron on there. Um, surprised not to see Makuba on there. Uh, surprised not to see a guy like Anthony Hill on there. So Texas got a lot of talented players that probably could have made that list or been close to it. The only schools that had more or as many players as Texas had on this top 100 list, Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama, and I think Michigan were the schools that I counted with just as many. Yeah, many. and I don't think anyone had as many in the top 15. I think Texas held the I, top at right number at that. three in the top 15, uh, I believe is the most. So we're saying top. That, that's the area. That's the cutoff we're putting for Texas fans. 15, cut it off. Yeah, no, you're right about that. I don't, I don't know if anybody had as many players in that top 15 as Texas. That's a good point. Yeah, high, Colorado had two of them. Yeah, <laughs> Colorado had two in the top four. Because <laughs> they actually did Sanders and they had Travis Hunter. Uh, but I'm with you. LSU, uh, I think LSU has two here that I can see. Uh, because, yeah, LSU has basically two. They had a tackle on here. Um, that's really high on this list. 
Um, yeah, but you're right. I don't – Alabama and Georgia, Oklahoma. No, I think you're right. I think Texas has more in the top 15 than everybody else. Good catch there, Patrick. Uh, that's why high expectations for Texas. And yes. we'll get a glimpse of that coming up this weekend with the Texas spring game. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. We come back. We'll play Who Said That as we wrap it up. Put in the oven. Last uh, segment of the week right here on the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Long Run. Rod Davis coming back on the horn.
All right, welcome back to the broadcast. 512 Friday. That's when Patrick the Idillionaire, my co host, plays jams from local bands and artists, very talented human beings that you have a chance to catch live right here in the ATX. Who are we jamming right now, Patrick? This is Duel, and they're playing Saturday at the Lost Well. Some hard Where rock. Where is the Lost Well? The Where Lost Well, I think it's off Weberville. Okay. Over there, oh, yeah, I know what that is, actually. I know what okay. that is, actually. I, I can, I'd recognize that. But man, I don't know. There you go, the Lost Well. Um, Patrick, always hooking you up, uh, keeping you in the know uh, about where you can catch some of the most talented human beings uh, here in the Austin area, uh, cultivating their craft in the live music capital of the world. All right, let's get to our uh, Who Said That segment. That's when Patrick plays a little bit of audio, and based on the context clues or based on the audio itself, you're supposed to be able to decipher and figure out who said that who are your basketball role models growing up katie katie Giannis. those are the two the two main ones if you could download a move mm-hmm. from another player yeah. into your mind what would that move be it would be like there's something katie does i don't know if you like if you ever noticed but like everything he does even off ball is like this one it's not really a hesitation because it's so quick but like this one microsecond where he where he stops and that's enough to like take advantage and defender because he doesn't really sprint ever but he's she, she just moves very quick and he's got that like that KD timing I call it like on every one of his movement and it's once I've noticed it it's become flagrant but it's so hard I try to do it but I'm gonna work on it this summer but it's so hard to do. There you go. Uh, that's Wimby. That is Wimbenyama. Man, he's already thinking about add moves to his repertoire. So Giannis trying to add and that KD. KD timing. Yeah, I don't even know what he's. I I think I know what he's talking about, but he's looking at it. Like I said, he's looking at it through the matrix. He's like, yeah, he's, he's looking like at the the, the microseconds of the game. Yes, <laughs> his sophomore exactly. Right. season, which is he said what he's at fifteen percent of where he's gonna go is what he said he's at right now. I did also hear another story when you talk about his maturity. They talked about J.J. Reddick was on the uh, Carmelo Anthony podcast and told a story of when Drake came to Austin, they reached out to Wimby and said, would you want to come on stage? And he said, can my teammates come with me? And they said, no. And he goes, okay, I'll pass. Wow. Whoa, he's that kind of dude. He's that dude. My Don't want none of my homies can't have some. Wow. And when I say they got, they have the most unselfish, iconic stars in the history of the nba yeah tim duncan david robinson i mean how do you and how do you get wimby unselfish superstar like that as now a generational talent nobody does it like the san Antonio Spurs. that's a great story i like that uh yeah gotta hate the drake oh you love the drake <laughs> it doesn't matter all right thank you man patrick doing a great job remember the revolution will not be televised we'll be talking about it right here on the broadcast uh everybody have a great weekend uh we love you we mean that take care of yourselves but more importantly take care of each other and until monday uh we love you guys hook them peace